Welcome everyone to Senate Education this Thursday afternoon, February 18th. Uh, we have with us Chair Samuelson and Sarah Buxton. Uh, Chair Samuelson, we know, is the Chair of the State Board of Education. And Ms. Buxton, you are Special Counsel to the State Board of Education, correct? That's Great. correct. Thanks. So what I thought we needed some time in committee to do, since it's in the press so much and we continue to have a number of different conversations and even questions from constituents and colleagues, is to go over the 2200 rule series. And if you don't mind, I think, unless I see some immediate questions, I'll just turn it over to the two of you to take us through what these are. They're talked about a lot, what's in them, and then we'll have some questions. Great. Um, and I think that's a really good way to frame it. Um, okay. I, we'll interrupt with questions, too. I think that's this committee. Yeah. While it's fresh, people can jump in. Well, yeah, you know, you know, thank you. Um, it's good to be back again. I'm Jennifer Dex Samuelson. I'm the chair of the State Board of Education. Um, nice to see you all, although a little farther away this time. Um, and I am joined today by attorney Sarah Buxton, who's been retained by the board to assist us with updating Rule Series 2200. Um, to incorporate the principles and goals of Act 1 of 2019. Um, and before I jump into this, I just want to preface this with the general overview that um, the board takes our responsibilities very seriously, and we are absolutely committed to implementing strict anti-discrimination and inclusion requirements in all of Vermont schools, including our approved independent schools. We've taken enormous steps to achieve this aim through the last and current round of rulemaking, which I'm kind of referring to as phase one and phase two, and I'll get into that shortly. The rules we dis are discussing today have the power of law. They're very strong rules. In fact, there are several parts of the rules, including the non-discrimination provisions that are significantly more robust for approved independent schools than they are for public schools. And we can address that point at another time at the committee's um, pleasure, if you'd like. With, with my thanks to Morgan for his assistance, I sent to each of you this morning the following, um, the slideshow presentation, which I believe everyone um, has, as well as, um, and this is where it gets a little bit more lengthy, the current version of Rule Series 2200 that is fully effective as of July 1st of 2023, the proposed updates to Rule Series 2200 as they were filed with ICAR this past fall, and a detailed side-by-side -side that Sarah prepared so that it's clear what changes are being proposed. You can review the rule series and the side-by-side -side at your leisure, but we thought it would be helpful to have everything at your fingertips so that you understand the, the work that we've done and the work that we are continuing to do. These rules are comprehensive. They reflect many hours of work by board members and input from stakeholders, and we are proud of them. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump to my first slide. Um, I would just say my only recommendation in all of this would be talk to the committee like we don't know much about rules or anything. I mean, I really want us all to have this, make the language our own after we have this conversation. So uh, as much as you can do that, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I have a few slides that are sort of setting the table for great. our discussion. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let me just, you know, jump to slide two. Um, I do want to point out um, after we met last week and I couldn't remember where our student members were from. I did update that just so that we're all clear. So um, our junior member, Gray Farron, is from Panton and he's a student member. Um, he attends Virginia's Union High School. Um, Aaliyah Wilburn is our senior member um, and she attends North Country Union High School. Um, the other update, which I have for you, which is unrelated to these rules, is this computer case of mine, which now you can't see anymore, is from Etsy. It would appear to be handmade. Don't have any more information on that, but I'm happy to give anyone the link who would like it. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. And are you going to be pulling the slides up on your side as well, or would you like to just say next? How would you like to do this? Well, if if members have the slides up, then um, that might be the easiest way. Otherwise, I can share my screen. Oh, that's fine. Um, so I'm on slide three. Oh, there's a concern that people in the uh, watching might not see, be able to see. Got it. Great point. So why don't you go ahead and pull them up if you don't mind? Sure. Um, give me just a second. If you enable my sharing, I don't mind sharing 
if Jen, you need to look at your screen. Okay. Um, this is going to be embarrassing. How, <laughs> Sarah, okay. what do I need to I got do? It. Okay. Again. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great. Thank you. Um, so let me just go back to my version of it. Um, okay. So on slide three, I just listed out um, who from the State Board of Education is on this Rule Series 2200 update committee. Um, the committee has not changed from you know phase one, our last iteration of updates, um, to this current iteration of updates. So I am chairing it, and I'm joined by Kim Gleason and Tom Lovett. Um, the next slide, um, slide four, this series, it, this slide is really kind of setting the table, and I've got a few of these, but this really just kind of starts with what authority does the board have and what are the effect of our rules? So pursuant to 16 VSA 164.14, the board is required, this is mandatory, it's a shall in statute, um, we are required to adopt rules for the approval of independent schools. The rules are then adopted pursuant to Vermont's Administrative Procedure Act, and they have been codified as Rule Series 2200. As duly adopted administrative rules, these rules have the power of law. Compliance with them is not discretionary. And I think that's really important for the um, committee to understand. Next, this is another little place setting um, series of slides. This is slides five, six, and seven. Um, these are the roles, um, and it's, Funny to me, Vermont is a small state, but yet we have both a agency of education and a board of education. And I've received a number of inquiries where people are really confused about, you know, who does what, you know, what what is the the purpose, you know, what is the the role of the board. So, I wanted to take a minute and just really clarify that. I don't know if you know the committee also has similar confusion, but I just thought it'd be helpful to lay it out here. So, the board, you know, the, the, you'll notice, you know, based on the size of the font of this slide. We really have three basic roles. We are um, we adopt rules for approval. We make findings before we approve schools that meet the requirements of Title 16 and our rules upon recommendation of the secretary. And we conduct quasi-judicial due process hearings to revoke or suspend independent school approvals, again, upon recommendation of the secretary. The next two slides, slides six and seven, um, I'm not going to read these. I'm just going to, you know, there's slide six or Sarah <laughs> and slide seven. You'll notice you know, the font's much smaller. Um, there are a lot more bullets. There are a lot more responsibilities that the agency is charged with. Um, these roles are more varied and they're more extensive. The system that we have in Vermont is designed for each entity to perform specific functions that align with their structure. And this makes sense when you consider our resources. The State Board is an independent board that's made up of essentially volunteers who bring various backgrounds and expertise in the educational field to our positions, but we all have other jobs, we have an extremely modest budget, and we have no staff. The agency, by contrast, is comprised of professionals whose duty it is to enforce and monitor compliance along with its many other duties. And as you can see in slides six and seven, this work is enormous. The agency is not sitting on its hands. It's not ignoring matters related to independent school, schools. Their work in this area is extremely time intensive and thorough. Um, there are site visits, there's technical assistance, there's scrupulous review, and this all takes time. But you know, much as we want to reassure you know, the committee and members of the public that a school that is approved has been through an extensive process, any, you know, assistance for an independent school, any you know, investigation of complaints with regard to an independent school is also similarly thorough so that the public can have confidence in our process. Um, I'll also just take a moment here to foreshadow that um, in the newly proposed rules, we recognize that um, you know, there, there are a lot of tasks that are being assigned to the agency and we are proposing to um, have an annual assurance for independent schools to complete that will just ease future backlogs by adopting some minor coordination checkpoints. So moving on slide eight, um, this is now going to, what I'm referring to as our phase one updates. So these were updates that um, were largely um, enacted in response to Act 173 of 2018. So there were you know, two sets of updates to um, phase one. 
the first set of rules became effective um, upon adoption. So that was May 10th, 2022. And then the second set, which really you know pertained to the Act 173 related changes, those only became effective July 1st of 2023. Um, and that change involved rewriting Rule 2229 and adopting approval criteria for approved independent schools to receive public funds. So that was a pretty significant rewrite that we did there. Uh, we have a question from Senator Hewitt. Sure. Oh, it's, it's more of a comment, um, and I do this sometimes in health and welfare. Can we, can we just slow down a little bit because there's a lot of information coming at us at once? Sure. So okay. in, in, I can pause too and see if there are any questions or, you know, that if you're great. to just check your understanding. Slow down a little bit. That would be great. Whatever speed the committee's comfortable with. Does anyone have questions at this point? Um, I actually I have a question. Um, is, what is the process as applications come into you? Um, how, are they vetted prior to arrival to the board by the AOE, or do they just come directly to the board? That's a really good question, and there is a very extensive process, which is laid out in, well, the rule numeration has changed, but um, it starts with, um, if a school is up for reapproval, they have to submit a timely application packet. Um, and that is in, I believe it's current rule 2226. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very extensive what they need to submit. Once they have done that, the agency will conduct a um, site review. And they, um, the, the agency team that conducts the site review prepares a report. That report is vetted by agency counsel and it is reviewed and signed by the secretary at that point with the secretary's recommendation. At that point, that recommendation comes before the State Board of Ed um, 2200 School Approval Committee, um, which is Tom Lovett, Kim, um, Jenna O'Farrell and Lyle Jepson. So they meet with the agency, they meet with the school. Um, they have you know, a question and answer if, if there are any questions. Um, and I should say too, that this independent school is given an opportunity to respond to the secretary's recommendation. Um, so they have a meeting. And then based on that meeting, the um, 2200 approval committee then presents its recommendation to the full board. And then that happens at our monthly meetings where you know Tom Lovett will present us with the entire packet, um, including the secretary's recommendation and the report from the agency team. Uh, we have a discussion. Um, the school is there if we have if board members have any questions, and then we vote on it. May I just interrupt? You also are required to make findings, Jennifer. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's um those findings carry over into the, the uh, next iteration. Thanks. So I guess, I guess that's just to say that I'm, I've pulled it up on the screen here. I'm not sure if you can see it, but the current rules, it starts in section uh, 2226, and you can see there's a variety of things that are required in the application. But then in the approval process, you know, the agency does all its work, as Jennifer said, the subcommittee does its work, but then in addition, the board has to make a number of, of findings that um, you know are pretty robust, and then they can make their um, their decision about whether a school is approved or not. And they can grant they can put conditions on the schools. I'm not sure if that's been done in recent times, but they can. It has, them. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And when you say things like pretty robust, can you point us in that direction so we know what yeah. you're... Yeah. Um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point you in two places. One is where they are now, which is up on my screen. And then I'm going to pull up the new set of rules because they've been reorganized um, a little bit for usability, but for another reason I'll get to in a second. So the robustness of the review um, starts here. I don't know. Can you see my screen? Okay. You want to make it a little larger, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. So this, what I'm, what I'm um, looking at right now is um, section, let's see if I can make it any larger. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, oh, great. 
Yeah, you. thank you. Okay. So I'm looking at the, these are the current rule, rule Senator. Um, so uh, the current application requires, you know, some basic information. Um, and as you can see, those include this, the school's um, statement of philosophy and purpose, description of their enrollment practices. That I'll highlight is different for publicly, for um, the application to receive public tuition under the, under the current rules and has been sort of reorganized under the proposed rules. Um, the plan of organization, uh, governance, faculty, student body, names and addresses of the governing board, description of curriculum, methods of instruction, evaluation procedures, special services, et cetera. And then the really, uh, I think one of the important parts that was added in the last update, which was phase one of 2200, is this part right here that I've got highlighted. And it says that um, the school needs to comply uh, and provide, um, sorry, demonstration that the school substantially complies with all statutory requirements for approved independent schools and provides documentation of the following. A statement of non-discrimination posted on the school's website, and those are checked um, in the school's app and included in the school's application materials that is consistent with the Vermont Public Accommodations Act um, and the Vermont Fair Employment Act. Uh, I'm sorry, Vermont Fair Employment Practices Act. Um, the assurance signed by the head of school that the school complies with the Vermont Public Accommodations Act in all aspects of the school's admissions and operations, and a description of the facilities um, to and assurances that the facilities meet all applicable state and federal requirements. Um, I'll skim through some of the rest because they're probably what you would typically think of that you'd be looking at with a school. Um, information about their staffing. Um, their staff qualifications, the job descriptions, the resumes, um, the assignments of all the staff members, um, how the um, institution approaches um, professional growth of staff and supports professional development, um, and what, they, what they've done over the last two years. So it's both like, what is your policy, but then show us evidence of what has happened. Um, more information about the professional environment, Financial capacity here is, is actually um, largely lifted from statute. The legislature adopted this many years ago um, and is certainly has always had an interest in making sure that approved um, schools are, um, um, you know, are, are certainly not gonna go under anytime soon. And then the second part of this, as I had said, it was robust, is that the agency is collecting all this information. They're doing their site visit. They're creating the report that Jennifer had mentioned. But then before the board, which sits in this, um, this sort of um, check and balance in the process, when the board acts, it goes over all of that homework that it's been presented with, considers the, app, the recommendation of the secretary and then needs to make the following, these findings prior to approval. Um, examples include the course of study is adequate. Um, the school has the available support services to meet the requirements of the minimum course of study. Um, everything including uh, library and um, administrative services, guidance and counseling, um, a system of records by which student progress may be assessed. Um, all of the facilities information that the school employs professional staff were qualified by training and experience in the areas in which they are assigned. I think that's a really important part to note because I think what that is intended to do is, you know, we all acknowledge that the licensing requirement is not the same for independent schools, but that's not to say there is no consideration of professional um accountability or professional status this this clearly asks the board to make that finding that they that the professional staff are qualified by their training and experience um, and for teachers that they have a minimum of a bachelor's degree in their field of instruction um, more on professional staffing um, that The school substantially complies with all the statutory requirements for approved independent schools, including non-discrimination. 
um, and other requirements that are in your uh, are in Title 16 and actually Title 18 is the immunization of students against disease. Uh, that the school maintains their register of daily attendance. Again, um, operational matters, financial matters, that the school is in compliance with the child protection registry and the vulnerable adult abuse, neglect and exploitation registry. Um, a few years ago, I believe this bill may have originated in the Senate uh, or, or maybe it didn't, but, I, but you did update um, the law and it's now in the rules that the school complies with legal requirements concerning non-discriminatory school branding. Ms. Bobstein, we have two questions. I think Senator Williams has a question and Senator Hewlett. Well, it was, the question was back in uh, Rule 2226, 2226, and um, the, these standards that we're holding independent schools to, are the, are the public schools being held to the same standard? Um, do you want me to answer that, Jennifer, or do you, would you like sure. to answer that? Sure. No, you can. So, um, the public schools, and I don't have this up on my screen to show you, but it is something actually the board is, is really engaged in at this moment. Um, the statute requires that the board establish education quality standards, and it um, and it notes what those education quality standards need to address. They aren't, uh, I'll just say at an overall level, they don't, on, on the whole, they are not as detailed as this. They are general, but I don't know that I can say that they are more or less robust. Um, they're just different. And I, I'm actually doing some work for the board to try to compare and contrast some of the areas where these these rules are the same and where they're different. For example, you know, all schools need to have a ha have a hazing, harassment, um, and bullying policies, and all schools need to um, adhere to the immunization requirements. So there there are many things that are the same requirements, but as you're seeing right now on my screen the professional development and the professional support and the instructional strategies are different. You know, curriculum is decided in an independently governed board by the independently governed or independently governed school by that entity. Whereas the curriculum in a public school is determined at the supervisory union level. Thank I don't you. think I quite answered your question they're not exactly the same. Well, I think that's um, no, but it's hard to see where we can have one standard uh, for academic excellence if we're being held to different standards of uh, compliance. So that was my point. Thank yeah, you. I can, you're a very good point. I will put, I will let you know that um, in Title 16, um, you do require the board to promulgate um, standards of performance, and those apply to public schools. But you also require them to um, approve assessments for those standards of um, performance. And the assessments, meaning the testing, those apply to both. And so there is data, and this is something you may want to follow up to find out what the data looks like and and you know how that's presented. You may want to follow up with the agency, but but to say that we don't have a handle on the performance of independent schools versus public schools in terms of academic excellence, um, what we we do have the assessment data for how how students are performing, and that's reported up through through the secretary. Senator Hewlett. Yes, I do have a question. Thank you. But I do, I want to echo Senator Williams' great point that it is a shame that we have this bifurcated system with two separate um, levels of, um, you know, assessment and oversight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for bringing that up, Senator Williams. Um, I am wondering about, in terms of the financial viability piece, um, and I'm sorry if you said this, Sarah, and I missed it, but 
Um, do these items have to be published? So, for example, like when you talk about finances, do, are you required to publish the finances of each school? Uh, no, actually, in the statute in Title 16, um, there are exempt the public records exemptions for independent schools for for select pieces of information, and I can get you that precise reference, um, but not all information is public record. I can't, I can't tell you that, um, you know, which documents are and which aren't, but I know that there are some exemptions. Um, the tuition is not, you know, the amount of, of co the cost for tuition is something that's reported and tracked by the agency. Um, but there isn't a publishing requirement at this time. Okay, thank you. So, and I will just, a couple of things to tack on to what Sarah's presented here. One is, um, you know, just thinking back on approvals that the board has considered in the last, you know, year or two, um, the question of qualification of staff, um, we declined to approve a school um, because we had concerns about um, the staff qualifications for at least one of the teachers. Um, and there was another school that we considered where we were concerned about the financial viability. And you know we have the authority to grant um, approval up to five years. I believe that school, we granted approval um, for one year um, because we wanted them to come back and you know assure us that they were financially viable. So we do take the rules very seriously. And you know it, it's not like we're rubber stamping either based on the secretary's recommendation or what's written in the rule. I mean, we, we really do go through these rather thoughtfully. The other thing I would say is these rules 2226 that Sarah just reviewed with you, that goes to a school's approval. So this is kind of like the first lever in the system. Um, you know, this, this is sort of, is a school going to be an approved independent school or is it going to be a recognized independent school? And if it wants to be an approved independent school, even before we get to the question about public tuition funds, it has to comply with 2226. And I've just pulled up the, the new version, the proposed rules, which are two thirds of the way through the Administrative Procedures Act, you know, for rulemaking. And they're organized a little bit differently and it may help um, this committee, or I'm, I'm hoping you're pleased with where the board went with this. Um, rather than categorizing the information as here's what you need to have in your, um, approval, I'm sorry, your application package, and here's what the board needs to, um, uh, the findings that the board needs to make. We reorganize this slightly so that it's very clear that the, that it's not that you have to provide evidence just for an application, that everything that the board has promulgated in these rules with regard to operations are actually requirements to operate. They're of course precursors to becoming approved, um, but they are their requirements to operate. And so as you have the time to go through the proposed rules, you will see that they're significantly even more robust, not necessarily because the board added a lot of new things, but the board had um, asked me to go into the green books and pull out all of the requirements that are in there that apply to independent schools um, and to include them in this as well. Um, you'll also, I thought I would just pause for a second and also note that the board bolstered again, the non-discrimination requirements and the non-discrimination um, statement and policy. So that not only is some of this language familiar to you because we just went over it, um, but we also added that the agency will develop a standardized method to assess the school's compliance with this subsection. Um, and it shall be used to investigate complaints of non-compliance. Um, and it will be used when evaluating applications for approval by accredited and non-accredited schools. Um, the method will provide indicators of compliance and shall be made available to schools for their ongoing self-assessment. The board thought this was really important because I think when we talk uh, about just, compliance, uh, just a second, you, uh, you can finish. Sure. Okay, okay. go ahead and then Senator Buick has a question. Sure. I think when the when when the when there's uh, monitoring around non-compliance, the 
some board members were concerned about um, without a standardized tool that there may be subjectivity. And so they asked to have language in here that would create a tool so that it could be used and would, um, would, would sort of eliminate that subjectivity about compliance. Okay. okay. Thank, yeah, thank you. Um, I believe there's at least one school right now that's not complying and is still being considered as an approved independent school. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, I believe it's the Grace Christian School. So the, I mean, this goes back to my slide about um, the division of roles between the, the board and the agency. And that school has not come before the board for reapproval. So there's nothing pending before the board. That's something you know that the agency has to go through its process of reviewing and then making the recommendation that would then come before um, the state board subcommittee before it comes before the full board. Can you speak to why there's there seems to be a hiccup in that process? Why why is there that complexity that is not? Um, sort of drawing a line in the sand. I'm not sure I understand the, the the question, like why has it not come before the state board or? Sure, why is it held up in the AOE? Because earlier I thought you said that applications that come to you aren't necessarily vetted by the AOE, that they come directly to you. So I'm confused. No, I, I, I certainly didn't mean to communicate that if I did. Um, an application for approval always goes to the agency first because the agency has the staff that then conducts the site review, goes to the school, prepares the report. Um, that report is then reviewed by agency legal counsel. It's reviewed by the secretary. The secretary then makes a recommendation. The school then has a chance to respond to the secretary's recommendation. All of that happens at the agency level before it ever comes to the board. And all I can tell you is it has not come before the board. So it sounds, we were having a little bit of this conversation earlier today that it's 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 with the agency right now. If we have specific questions about moving this along, it, it lies with the agency. Yes, and I, I mean, I don't even know where it is with the agency because yeah. I mean, again, I'm not privy to that information. I all, we only see a school when it, when the agency has completed its review and then it no, comes. I appreciate to that. It, it's good clarification. Uh, there's been some confusion out there. I think whether it does lie with all of you or the agency. Uh, and so this, that, that part's very helpful. Okay. Senator Wilkins. No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I think. I was, I believe, oh, on... actually, if I may, sure. I just can local districts. One of the things that I believe might be happening somewhere, uh, local can local districts decide not to send money to a certain school. Again, my understanding is that there uh, is a list that is made available on the agency's website of yeah. schools that have been approved. And so if a school is on the agency's website as approved, then that is the signal to um, local school districts that they are authorized to send tuition payments to that school. But if they have concerns that a district, that a school is not following, kind of following up on Senator Hewlett's question, the anti-discrimination piece, can do they have the authority and the power themselves? Can a district say, hey, we're going to stop this now because it's it's not on the website. The attestation isn't there. That kind of thing. So they, I, I mean, I don't believe that a district would have the power to unilaterally make that decision. They would have to go through the complaint process, which is again laid out in rule, and that's a pretty robust process. But it starts with someone making a complaint or a report. Yeah that then goes to, and, and Sarah, I believe that's currently in 2220, now I can't remember. Yep, I can pull um, it up right here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a really important point because just to confirm what, what um, the chair said, it's true a, a local district 
Um, the way the system works, the board makes the list. They approve all of the schools. If a school is on that list, then the, the district may, you know, pays the tuition to that school. They can't uh, subjectively pick and choose which schools on that list they want, you know, they feel are, um, they feel like they want to send the funding to. Um, if they do have concerns, and it was a situation you just noted, um, Senator Campion, um, that they, they feel that, they're, that the school isn't in compliance. Um, unlike public schools, independent schools have a fairly robust um, complaint and investigation process. And there's a couple of things that can happen in this regard. Um, the complaint can happen and the secretary must conduct an investigation. In this case, the secretary, as they go through this process, could um, remedy the situation if it was, you know, the form wasn't filled out and the, the school just needed to fill it out. They could say, you know, you forgot, please complete this. Um, or if it's something more substantial, they can also put the school on probation while they pursue a formal investigation, which may lead to a recommendation to the board to revoke or suspend approval. Until the board goes through that due process hearing, which is required, we, we don't lose sight of the due process requirement here. Um, once, once that process has begun, um, the secretary can put them on probation can move through the formal investigation process, and then um, as a result of that investigation can recommend to the board to immediately revoke or suspend the approval. And um, that, like as I said, is, is unique to independent schools. And I do follow for Senator. Could anyone in the state make a complaint or do you have to be in the district? For example, if I were to review the schools right now and say to myself, gosh, I want to check all the schools in Vermont this weekend to see who may or may not be uh, putting forward their, the, the legal anti-discrimination policy. And I notice, oh gosh, there, there are three. And I wrote a letter of complaint. Would that move things along then logically from the agency? Yeah, there, there's no limitation in the rules um, as to who has standing to bring a complaint. It just says, but you. but you're, the process starts with a complaint. So I want to be yeah. really clear on that. And it's a complaint that is made to the secretary, right. and then the agency conducts the investigation. And once that investigation is, and again, like there's different you know layers that the the secretary has before it would come before the full board um, for our consideration. Thank you, Senator. I think this might be my last question, but we'll see. Um, I'd love to hear more about the layers you just mentioned, but we could do that some other time. Um, what is the time frame by which a school that is blatantly flouting the rules here, by which they need to comply uh, before they lose their approval status? So. Because it seems to me as though a school could be potentially discriminating for years, um, ostensibly, and and still be approved. So, is there a time frame that's in in this that's laid out? That's a good question, and I think you know right now we're kind of between two different sets of rules. Um, so the way the rules are written, and I mean it makes sense when you think about it. it there is a requirement that a school has to timely request reapproval. So if, if a school's request is not timely, then wow. they would have to go through the approval process all over again. But once they, I'm sorry? Uh, I just, timely, there's no, I, that that's, could be a year, that could be five years. Timely in geologic terms or in human terms, or I mean, what are we talking about? Timely. Sure. So if a school has been approved for four years, I yes. believe within six months prior to the expiration of that four-year approval, they would need to reapply for approval, or they would have to apply for reapproval. Maybe that's a better way to say it. So if they've been approved for, it, it wouldn't be more than five years, but you know, it could be one year, it could be five years. Um, 
prior to the expiration of that approval period, the school needs to submit a complete application for reapproval. If they don't, they lose their approval status. If they do submit it in a timely fashion, they are approved until um, they're not approved. And I did not write that rule, but I can intuitively understand that you wouldn't want to penalize a school for the secretary's delay or, you know, you know, whether that's intentional or otherwise, you wouldn't want to let the secretary allow certain applications to lapse because for whatever the secretary is thinking, you wouldn't want to penalize a school. Um, <laughs> there's an expectation that the school has to submit a timely application for reapproval, but then, you know, it's, it's in the secretary's hand. Um, this gets us into, you know, the, the new version, the phase two that we were looking at, where we are, um, and Sarah's put it up on the screen. This is new proposed language. Um, this is what the board is currently working on. Um, this is an annual compliance assurance. And part of the reason why the board, you know, took the initiative and put this into the rule was, you know, at the request of the General Assembly. Um, and so what this does is it says that by January 15th of every year, um, the school shall continue or shall attest to its continued compliance with applicable requirements of the rule series, as well as state and federal law. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, the board had a discussion we put in January 15th as the deadline, um, because if you think about, you know, school starting in September, if we have that deadline set, you know, seven months prior to the beginning of the school year, that allows families to make decisions about, you know, do they want their child to stay in that school? Do they need to find somewhere else to go? You know, we, we didn't want to disrupt families on August 15th and, you know, suddenly have everyone scrambling to find a school. So, and Sarah's highlighting language in here that um, this annual compliance assurance form um, would contain. And there's also a process that um, this is what happens if a school does not timely submit it. So, um, you know, the first step is that the secretary would reach out to the school and say, hey, you know, you haven't submitted your form on time. You need to get that in. Um, if they if the school still doesn't, then the secretary shall launch an investigation. Senator, I, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me how many schools in total are out of compliance with uh, with the rules, the 2200 rules. I don't know of any. Um, I mean, there aren't any that have come before the board. So, um, again, so it would start with the complaint the agency, and would then go to the agency. Yeah. The agency so. is also required to, um, in these rules, in the current version of the rules, is required to maintain records of complaints in schools that they put on probation. So you can ask. For that, that is a new that is a new requirement with the current with the current rules. I mean, it's in place, um, but they are they are required now to collect that data. Um, I also just wanted just to make sure we put a fine point on um, the senator's earlier question about how long can a school be out of compliance. Right now, under current rules, as the chair said, four and a half years until they have to prepare information, but but maybe by July, if these rules make it through and over the promulgation point by July, it will not be that long. This attestation or this um, annual assurance is really important. And it does two things. One, it tightens that time frame to say annually, there needs to be a check on whether or not compliance is still in place. And if that's not found to be satisfactory, Remember, um, Chair Campion, earlier you said, can anybody, you know, launch an investigation or launch a complaint? That is true. However, the board opted in this instance that if that assurance process, um, uh, if, it, if, it, if the school is failing to meet that assurance requirement, the secretary shall launch the investigation. So it immediately begins that process where formal investigation could result with revocation and it just speeds up that process a lot faster um, so that you don't Sarah, have Sarah, that. Just, uh, if I may just follow that point, in that shall, in terms of investigation, could the secretary also at that point immediately put the school on probation? Yes, and that, absolutely. And does that halt public funding going to that school when it's on probation? Um, it doesn't halt public funding because that requires a due process hearing before okay. 
before. Um, but it does accept, and that that's the that's the constitutional consideration we we're sort of juggling here. Um, but it does mean that this is going to be addressed right away. The other reason for it is there are uh, requirements about disrupting um, the student. Um, students, if you were to all of a sudden say students can't go to that school on Tuesday, or they could on Monday, um, part of the due process requires, you know, their their interests as well. Sarah, she, so sorry to be uh, repetitive with this question. I just want to make sure I confirm that Currently, all approved independent schools in Vermont that are receiving public dollars, all of them are abiding by every uh, every 2200 rule, right? I, I think you can't answer it that they are in the same way that you can't say that all public schools are complying with all of the educational quality standards. I... Um, so I don't know, Jennifer, if you have more to say in that, because you, I think you had already said that you didn't have the complaints, but. Yeah, like there are no complaints pending before the board. Um, so I, I think, you know, we have a system of checks and balances that have been set up. The, the board has very, you know, clearly delineated roles. The agency has very clearly delineated roles. And, you know, we have crafted these rules. The rules are effective, but, um, you know, if a member of the public has concerns about a school, the proper process then is to file a complaint or report with the secretary. Could I just ask, you know, if this happens also in a public school, if there is a concern that somebody's being discriminated against, I did you say, and I just want to make sure I have this, there's no process for public schools complaint processes? Um, kind of would come to light with the, the two committees I'm working with and the board. One is handling the education quality standards and the other is working on the 2200. Is that the independent school rules are far more robust. They have that complaint process in um, in there. The EQS- oh, I understand that. I'm just wondering about the kid who might well, be in public school. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't anything in EQS that has um, has that yet. There are, there is a, there is a, um, um, there are mechanisms already available. For I'm aware of um, special education complaints that the agency is federally required to take complaints related to special education. Um, but I think the agency may be able to describe any other complaints that, and how they follow up on those in public schools. But they are very specific in independent schools and not so in the um, in the public schools. And I'll just. I'll just add to that too. I mean, if, if there were a complaint that were filed, you know, that the agency investigated and then, you know, referred to the board for a due process hearing. And let's say that the board, you know, took the agency's recommendation and um, revoked a school's approval status. That, I mean, that, that goes right to the heart of a school. You know, we've now demoted that school from an approved independent school to a recognized independent school. Um, it, if it's a approved independent school that is receiving public funds, it is no longer receiving public funds. There's no corollary with the public school system. Um, there might be a complaint, but and there might be a finding of wrongdoing, but that wouldn't take away the ability of the public school to receive public funds or you know continue to operate as a practical matter. Uh, and the reason is there were some headlines this summer, I think about uh, some different students that were being discriminated against. And I, I'm not seeing as perhaps one of the things we could work on is is putting something in place for those students as well. Um, yes, yeah, Senator Go. Well, I just want to say because I've been through this that uh, we there's a district in my um, area that uh, was found to be discriminating against a student, and it went up to the federal level, mm -hmm. and they were literally under investigation for and had to apply with certain rules for a number of years before they were, were released from that lawsuit. So just cool. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's it felt very robust. I just want to say that much for, for what it's worth. Um, it sounds like you had to go through the court system. Well yeah. and, then they, and then they had to follow a bunch of rules to get sort of out of that. Um, it sounds like this frankly they could maybe if we created something they might not have to go all the way through the system. Okay. And get lawyers and that kind of thing. 
My 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 question was: um, Is there? Do you have a list of public schools that are not following EQS? Again, no. Um, I, Nothing like that has ever come before the board. So I, I I don't even have an answer to the question of are there public schools that are not complying with EQS? Okay, well, because it was you were someone was speculating that a few minutes ago. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. It's the secretary's duty to make that determination. The reason I I I raised that is when um um the question was asked, um, you know, how many are out of compliance? The the monitoring of Vermont's education system. Um, need, uh, at no level makes this check of you're either in this box or in, in this box. And so it's based on um, the, the complaints at this point. And at least with edu with um, the independent schools, they at least have to go through a five year, they have to be up for review every five years. Or um, less. Or less. Yep. If they're conditioned to, to say less. And so I can't, I guess the, the question was framed in a way that it, it isn't possible to answer because that's not the way that compliance is um, implemented for education for schools in the state. That's a better answer to me than speculating yeah. that there are a bunch of schools that aren't complying with EQS, just just FYI from my perspective. Yep. You know, I apologize. I didn't I didn't mean to suggest that they weren't I, if if there were schools that weren't complying with EQS, you wouldn't necessarily know that either, unless you know there are allegations that might come out in a, a lawsuit. Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, you want to continue? We don't have a lot of time. Um, right. Have you back? But this has been very useful, and I think for me at least, it means we really need the Agency of Education in to ask the same kinds of questions of them. Since yeah. you're, for, in my opinion, a lot of their work. <laughs> well, and again, I think it's really helpful to go back to um, the slides that really delineate the roles between the agency and the board. Um, and I think, you know, with, with good reason, people don't necessarily understand, you know, how the roles between the two entities are divided. Um, and certainly we need to continue to work on dividing these roles and responsibilities. But I think you know these slides really capture what the process looks like um, you know, between the agency and the board. And, and the board's roles here are, are pretty straightforward and pretty simple. And that the agency has a lot of work on its plate um, with regard, I mean, to go through what we've at what the board has asked in these rules for them to do is extremely time intensive if it's done well and it and they do do a good job um and i i don't think they have i don't know two staff people maybe in their in that division so it's a um it, it's a heavy lift and and i think that's worth noting i understand no. that the, hey, yeah. i understand that the aoe has a lot on their plate but when it comes to discriminating against children i think that should be bubbled up to the top of the list and we'll have the agency in next week uh for a similar conversation all right so should we stop there um i, I wasn't really sure what the committee wanted. I can keep going or we can. Are there any other key highlights before we shift to Act 127 that you think we should know at this point? Um, let me just. And frankly, I would welcome you to come back, not come back in when the agency's in, but watch the agency's testimony, one or both of you, to see if you want to, there's a chance to respond, or maybe we do have you both back. Okay. Let me let me just point out, like I am looking at slides, you know, nine and ten in the current non-discrimination requirements. These are rules that are currently in place, and in particular, Rule twenty two twenty nine. That's the rule, you know, the next lever. Now we're talking about an approved school, but in order to receive public funds, the school also has to comply with twenty two twenty nine. So I would encourage the committee to, you know, take a good look at that because that too is. Um, pretty detailed in terms of the requirements. Um, and then, you know, we are currently working on applying the principles and goals of Act 1 of 2019 to independent schools. And I think the one thing that's really noteworthy there that I would just, you know, maybe leave the committee with is we have not heard from a single independent school, um, you know, complaining about applying Act 1 to independent schools. 
In fact, what we got a lot of were um, schools reaching out to the board to say, this is great. We're already doing this work. We appreciate having this requirement in the rules. Um, you know, thank you. So we we didn't hear any complaints from independent schools, you know, suggesting otherwise. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah. I just want to leave you with one thought, which is one that we hear in all of our committees in this building, which is that rules are only as good as their enforcement. Right. And and I, I that's why we really, I mean, from where I'm sitting is gotta have the agency in to talk about this. And I think it's I think we all might agree it's part of a larger question in terms of how many people are in the agency to do all this work. And one of the things that would be interesting to know is do they have, for example, who's their point person on this? Do they have somebody or is this something else just the careless does honestly in addition to everything else go around and check the anti-discrimination? And I think the the um, annual assurance will go a long way toward facilitating that. Um, that is a new requirement. It is not currently in the rule. And so that that's work that the board is you know undertaking to close that loophole so that there will be this annual um, feedback from schools to the agency, again, with this provision where if the school doesn't submit it, then the, that would instant or not instantly, but it would it would launch the formal investigation process. Along with a standardized, you know, non-objective way of assessing whether or not, you know, you're discriminating, that that rubric and that tool is going to be really important, both to, to independent schools and recognized schools and public schools. Anyone who wants to use it, you would assume, you know, non-discrimination is non-discrimination and the laws apply equally. Thank you both. Thank you. If senators have specific questions for you, you're both available? Sure. Okay. And uh, if it seems that the committee wants to have you both back when we have the agency next week or at a different time, we will be in touch. All right. Thank you all. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you both. Bye-bye. Morgan, let's take five minutes before we shift gears. Yeah, sure. Everyone to Senate Education. Excuse me. Um, we are returning to conversation around financing, Act 127, an act relating to improving student equity by adjusting the school funding formula and providing education quality and funding oversight. We have a joint hearing next week on school budgets, taxes, what we're seeing out there. We're going to be with the Finance Committee, we're going to do a House Education, and we're going to be with uh, Ways and Needs Committee uh, in the House. This will help give us a little bit more information on Act 127 before we go into that. Good question. I was giving Marty some thumbs up. Okay. No worries. I'm getting her seltzer. Yes. Okay. Would you like it? I'm good. Thank you. Good. Yeah. We're all set. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's okay. So, uh, okay, now that Senator Hewlett's here, uh, <laughs> we are ready to go. So, Ms. Siglowski, thanks for joining us. You're you? welcome. You're welcome. Um, I'm here with Jeff Francis and Morgan Daybell. We're we're doing this together, the three of us. And and uh, so I think our approach is that we we can certainly provide you with some basic information. Um, it's very good to hear that you are meeting uh, collaboratively with those other committees next week on this topic. Yes. And um, then we're really. Um, here to answer any questions that you have. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Francis and Mr. Daybell. I, what I think we would love to uh, understand a little bit more. Oops. 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 There we go. There we go. Okay. So what we uh, we'd love to understand more about how 127 is impacting schools, school districts, what you're seeing out there. I suspect I'd be shocked if all of you are not invited next Thursday to have this conversation with all of us. Uh, 
all four committees. So I thought this might give us an opportunity to tee things up and have a conversation so that when we get there Thursday, um, it'll be as productive as possible. Uh, so, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, it, it is the does the way the system work, and I haven't been remotely in your committee yet this year. Will like one person mute, unmute at the time at a time to speak? Is that how? It's a great question. Is that the protocol? Would you know what gave us the echo? 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 There must be something. In, is it possible, there Jeff? That, um, is it possible, Jeff? That um, hmm. I don't think. I think. How, how is it now? Uh, perfect. Uh, perfect. Oh no, it's not. Can you go get? Can you go get? Gonna get the IT person in. For the meantime, if you the don't reason mind, that I ask. Is, yeah, let me. I'm gonna mute. But we can't hear you, of course, when you mute. So there's some kind of uh, little issue. But the IT person will be here momentarily. Jack, do you have mul I wonder if you have multiple screens open. You can just close one. Sometimes. Oh, OK. No, I think that may be it. Is that That's working better, better now? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. I apologize for that. It's not. It's not. Okay. It's for a second. It's for a second. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it just if I don't know if you've got an echo there, and that sounds like I don't you do. Know if you've, got you've got two Senate Ed committees here in this Zoom, and I think you're getting echo off yourself. So one needs to be muted. They just said to move the speakers away from the, the, the camera or to use headphones. Yes. Would you bring her in, please? Okay. This might be the sign. I think it's on our end. Right. Yeah, because it was both Jeff and okay. both Jeffs. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a recording device, you have that in your corridor. Yes. Well, you have this giant lung pump here. We believe it's on our end. Okay. Anyone have a laptop? Oh, no. Okay, Jeff, do you mind trying again? Do you mind unmuting and testing? Testing one, two. I think we're still having the same problem. I think we're still having the same problem. Yeah. What would you suggest they do? Oh, really? Gremlins. Yeah. Oh, really? Gremlins. It's definitely gremlins. Yeah. Marching back your phone, just to make sure it's not your phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not going to go on. It's my phone. Is Jeff the only one who happened to you? No, Jeff and Paul. Okay. They, they all happened to you. Maybe we should have. To try again. Ian? Should we try again? Uh, Jeff Thannon, can we try with you? Sure. I think the problem may be that you have two Senate Eds open and echoing off each other. It's not because he's not stopping. We're not doing it right now. Sound good yeah. right now. Sound Sounds great. good. Sound better? Yeah. 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 Jeff, we're right. just waiting for Jeff Francis and we'll check with Jeff Francis. But Jeff Thannon, you thought it was what? 
I'm seeing two Senate education Zoom rooms. Ah, is that would that be making and, I, and one is not there, neither one is muted. This one, uh, that would be, yeah. this one it has nothing united. Yeah. So I and is know. there another? This one is the best this room, so it oh. needs to be unmuted. Yeah. And he's not hearing me. I couldn't ask Yeah, we're not hearing it now. It was Jeff Francis. Yeah. All right, Jeff Francis, will you give it a shot? Let's see how you do. See how you do. So I'll, I'll test it again. Yeah. So would you tell him? Yeah. Tell him? Yeah. Jeff, it sounds like you have a speaker on somewhere. Your... Okay, so so Charles, I'm gonna well, I'm gonna move to Sue Sigarski. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're starting. Are we starting? Yeah. I don't care. Okay, we're ready to go. Thanks, dude. Thanks, Delia. Thanks, Delia. Mr. Glowski. Yes, I am here, and Jeff is uh, coming down to my office. So he. <laughs> Thank you. I understand. He might have a couple of speakers on in his office that he doesn't. Somebody's probably recording him. He doesn't realize it. Uh, Mr. Francis, thanks for joining us. Uh, you heard the prompt. Uh, if you could just weigh in and let us know what you're hearing out there from school districts, superintendents, others on this, on the impact of Act 127. Sure. And if you don't object, Mr. Chair, I wanted to make just a couple of contextual comments first. Absolutely. Okay. So number one, thank you to whomever has called that hearing for next Thursday. Because I would say that the, the dynamics about the FY25 school district budgeting process and the transition to Act 127 um, uh, have a lot of people's attention and even increasingly so. So um, the reason that Mr. Daybell and Ms. Soglowski and myself have been traveling together on this topic is because the School Boards Association, the Business Managers Association, VASBO and VSA have been working together on the implementation of the law um, really since the late summer, early fall. And we've done a lot of professional learning around the transition to the new weights um, because school districts are adjusting to what's referred to in the law as tax capacity. As you know, that some districts have lost tax capacity where the weights adjusted their, their pupil count, which is the denominator in calculation, in calculating ed spending, um, has been lowered. And in places where the denominator um, increased, uh, it has a effect on the ed spending per pupil calculation. <clears throat> the reason that we've worked with VASBO is because that's the association of all the school district business managers um, and school boards for obvious reasons. They ultimately make the budgets. Um, so I think that we've been pretty effective in supporting our members through that process. Um, at our first testimony on the topic, which was in the House Ways and Means ago on January 9th, which seems like uh, a long time ago, but was really only 10 days or so ago, um, we focused on the cost pressures that school districts are experiencing in general. And the reason that we were asked to talk about the cost pressures is because when the December 1 tax letter came out, it had... Um, uh, lots of people's attention because of the predicted 12% increase in education spending FY25 over FY24 and the resultant property tax increases. Um, so that was something that everybody was concerned about. Um, I think that's justifiable. And they wanted to know, meaning the Ways and Means Committee, what we were seeing for cost pressures. And without um, going into great detail on that topic, I will say that, um, and I'm going to run through these quickly, um, in the post-COVID era, we've seen tremendous pressures on salaries and wages. Um, we've seen a steep increase this year in terms of health care costs. 
We've seen the manifestation of mental health needs societally as they play out in schools. And we're also contending with the loss of ESSER funds. ESSER monies were used to sustain us through the um, pandemic. And school districts are making individual decisions about whether to retain positions that they created with ESSER monies <laughs> and so on and so, so forth. Um, two complicating factors in terms of the cost standpoint is the recently released um, report on infrastructure needs in schools and also just the competitive market for school employees, period. So well, in summary, a lot of upward pressure on school district budgets. Soon after the um, December 1 tax letter was released, we started to hear more and more about the potential influences of the common level of appraisal. And on January 1, the tax department uh, released its equalization report and school districts, I think across the state were surprised to see that um, in many instances, the common level of appraisal was decreased in communities. So we're starting to hear not only about the 18% um, increase in property taxes, but also what the effects were of changes in CLA amounts and how that um, is contributing to projected tax rate, excuse me, tax bill increases in communities across the state. So that's an important part of the context. Second important part of the context is when you consider the education delivery system, we operate off a singular education fund, but we're deploying the monies from that fund across 120 school districts in Vermont. And those school districts, I think it's fair to say, are the manifestation of local control. So a lot of the features that exist community to community to community, um, depending on perceived wealth in the community, what their historic governance models have been, um, whether there's been transition in their administrative staff, um, transition in school board members, it all plays out differently. So it's a complicated system to begin with. When 127, as a transition in order to introduce more equity into the system, came to pass, it became even more complicated. So now we're at a place where um, school districts are wrapping up their FY25 budget preparation. The General Assembly is right at the start of its own legislative session. So when you have that hearing next week, I think we should predict that there's gonna be a lot of different input from school officials and others representing communities across the state that are going to respond to the dynamics that I just described in an overview. And one of the things that we're seeing right now is, is Act 127 working in the way that it was intended to. And a central question I think associated with that implementation goes to a feature in the bill, which is the 5% um, property tax capping feature that said in order to support the transition, both to districts that were seeing added tax capacity and those that were losing tax capacity, um, what's the utilization of that 5% capping feature? And frankly, um, I think we can, um, anticipate that it was used differently in different communities. So what we just started to learn about over the course of the last week is that some of the districts that lost tax capacity are using it to support um, spending um, both to, for lack of a better term, use a, a soft, you know, create a soft landing for themselves. Um, but the, the, you know, the conversation in the building, and this is now, um, expanding is what you know what is the influence of that what it means for ed spending overall what the effects will be relative to the ed fund etc um so i was happy to hear that that um, hearing has been scheduled because um i think it's going to be an important opportunity for local school officials to come in and talk with legislators about just how this is working um so so that's sort of a, a 
my perspective on it as of today, I think that the influences um, community to community with respect to um, uh, gaining more tax capacity or less tax capacity are going to get ultimately filtered through the question, have we in year one of Act 127 implementation um, induced more equity into the system? And I think that's something that's going to need to be examined because the features of the bill that I just described, I think are playing out in, in different ways. So um, it's something that has the focus of the three associations, um, VSBA, VSA, and VASBO. Um, I think it's something that um, we both will and need to learn more about. Um, uh, and, and you know, that that's where, at least from my vantage point, we are today. Now, um, I think- yeah, Mr. Just, If, if I may just interrupt, um, Senator Gulick has a question. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francis, for this. Um, every, every time I hear it, it sinks in a little bit more and I have a better understanding, so I appreciate it. Um, my question around 127, and I'm looking forward to the hearing, don't get me wrong, uh, but I have the sense that um, there's not much we can do to stop the bleed this year. We might be able to fix that loophole for next year. That's a great question. But is there some, I mean, do you see, in your personal opinion, do you see a way to uh, minimize, uh, I can't use the word I want to use. The um, impact, the... Yeah, I'm trying to be, trying to be politically correct and fair in my language. Um, it, so we want this to be about equity, right? So is there a way to achieve the equity that we were hoping to get in Act 127 this year? So as you often hear when you have folks from the Joint Fiscal or Legislative Council before you, you they sometimes say that's a policy decision. Um, and I, wouldn't, I would not rule out um, actions that the legislature could take this year but my contribution, I think, could be to considering ideas that members of the General Assembly have itself. So Ms. Siglowski, Morgan Daybell, and I, I think we'll have all got experience working with the array of school districts that I referenced. But I would not, I, I, you know, I don't have anything um, on the top of my head that would... Um, address any problems that could arise from the first year implementation of Act 127, but either after that hearing or before, if legislators have ideas, um, you know, I, I'd be a, a, a eager participant in those discussions. But I don't have okay. anything to, I, I don't have I don't have anything to offer right this minute. Okay. You're talking specifically around what we could do even this year yeah so if the if the um depending on the problem statement right so if the yeah, problem yeah. statement is property taxes are rising too much mm -hmm. there might be some things the general assembly could do if the problem statement was we're concerned that we're not achieving the equity that we'd hoped for through act 127 there's mm -hmm. some things perhaps that the legislature could do but you know i think it's we're all painfully aware of the fact that the legislature just convened a couple of weeks ago, and we're talking about a budget development process that is pretty well um, completed, right? The school district started their budgeting process in October. Um, the data relative to their long-term average daily membership count, which is the equivalent of equalized pupils in prior years, that was that was not settled until just a couple of weeks ago for many school districts. The CLA numbers came out on January 1 and school boards who were working with um, what they considered to be I'll say predictive tax rates based on the budget work they had done were now confronted with, you know, steep increases in property tax bills because 
their CLAs had fallen. So um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a factor that I did not include in, in my opening comments, but another complicating factor <laughs> in this year's budget cycle has been the rapid gain in um, in uh, real estate values, uh, principally homestead values that I would say, and I don't have this factually, but I think people will largely agree, um, greater increases in real estate values um, over the last two year period than Vermont had ever seen before. So, you know, there are people who are more well equipped than I am to talk about how all these factors add up to mounting pressure on the education fund and local school district budgets. But um, it is true that that's a real factor this year. Yeah, I, I, one of the things we've talked about in this committee, everybody's talking about, is are we going to have a record number of budgets voted down? Uh, or And then people are going to go back to the drawing board. And what's that going to look like for uh, the spring and possibly even later? I mean, if I can make a comment on that, the one thing that is gratifying to me is that um, folks realize that there's a tremendous connection between state policymakers and what happens at the local level. We've got a statewide ed fund that supports all those local school district budgets. And if we're in a challenging period uh, right now, meaning the FY25 budget cycle, um, I think that we should remember that we're all in this together we ought to be working on this together. And if there is a way to alleviate whatever pressures we're going to experience, then um, we should be doing it together. I think that the, the public hearing next week is a good place um, or a good uh, initiative to contribute to that problem solving. I think that, you know, there, there could be a tendency, which I hope folks will resist, to point fingers at, at you know one of the participants or another, I, I you know as my from my vantage point as executive director of the Superintendents Association, I think it is all laudable intent on the part of everyone from the General Assembly all the way down to local school district officials, and to the extent that we have problems to solve, um, both known and maybe unforeseen, uh, we ought to all be turning into those problems together. Thank you. And just a clarification on my part, it's it's a joint hearing. I don't know how the, the witnesses, I think anybody who's interested in putting forward witness ideas are going to be more than welcome. Um, but I don't have the impression it's one of our more traditional public hearings where, you know, anybody, in, you know, wants to come in. I just Got it. Make... I understand. OK, thank you. Uh, Senator Williams. Is JF over to be involved in this sure. discussion? Yeah, we have to be there. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'd be happy to yield now to Mr. Glowski and Mr. Perfect. David. You probably yeah. would like to have me do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your message of you. Yeah, you made sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Jeff Bannis. Oh, we have Jeff Bannis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glowski, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to what uh, Jeff Francis expressed to let you know that um, we think it's very important for you to have the most up-to-date data that you can have in this situation and not to be relying um, only on stories from different districts. Um, so if, you, if you're able to get updated data um, through the Agency of Education, uh, we that we think that would be very, very helpful. I also wanted to let you know that the VSBA um, just got finished providing a, a webinar for our members about communicating their district's um, priority needs when um, presenting their budget. So it was all about how board members can work collaboratively to ensure passage of the budget, engaging with their community and strategies for making a clear connection between the budget and the vision and mission and priorities of their um, school district. So um, we hope that that information is going to be um, helpful to our members as they're working on passing their budgets. Um, and at this point, I'd be happy to hand it over to Mr. Daybell, if that's okay. 
Yes, please. Mr. Daybell, welcome. Thank you. And I don't really have much to add um, on top of what Jeff and Sue have already mentioned. I do want to say as, as my association, business managers across the state have been navigating um, the you know, additional uncertainty in the budgeting process this year, I think it's important to note that everyone, whether they're so-called advantaged or disadvantaged under Act 127, has been steadfastly in support of the underlying law and the, the concept of equity behind it. Um, so that has been, been universal, and I think we need to, to mention that right up top. Um, Jeff had talked about some of the funding um, pressures this year, and I would just add to that um, districts like mine that are seeing more, um, more students under the new model have been adding um, costs that maybe we would not have in the past, such as for one of my districts, an English language teacher that they did not have in the past. And that ultimately is the intent of 127. And, um, and so I think that there should be a recognition that while there, there are budgetary pressures, um, they're not all dire or negative. If I could, um, somewhere between possibly Morgan and Sue, uh, I, I believe at this point the districts have presented their budgets uh, and is there a, like a collated matrix of who's up and who's down and who, how it's, you know, just kind of like district by district on a summary or would that, is that best coming from our uh, JFO? Yeah, I don't believe that exists yet. I, certainly when I'm in one-on-one -on -one meetings with folks, I will ask where they are in the process and in terms of whether they're up or down and is their tax rate up or down. Um, but I don't think there's a, a comprehensive data collection that's out there um, since last November. Okay, so we're seeing it in the papers that this district just presents the budget, it's all this, you know, but it's not, you, you guys don't have it as a, as an organization, you don't collect that. Sorry, um, I don't. Yeah. Can I interrogate my colleague? Yeah. For the second time today. If he so chooses. Um, uh, can I do that? Yes. Are you are you asking for taxing capacity going up or down, or you want budget numbers? No, like budget. how high? Because what's you're, your increase? Just five percent. Right. Right. Yeah, we started okay. the conversation two weeks ago or right. so with, hey, here's the anticipated uh, or the overall budget impact right. and, um, which you know we're seeing piecemeal you know, no, like I, hear, I hear you i just wanted to make sure you weren't talking about taxi capacity not yet email yeah, it's really richter and see if she can zoom in for a minute yeah we will ask her yes just a question does the was there an education fund surplus last year that play into this at all i mean why why was there a surplus because i know that a lot of the a lot of property taxpayers uh, got a check or actually went back to the towns and a couple of my constituents found out about it and were really upset. Why didn't they come back to me? Now, I guess they're going to apply that surplus, that, that rebate to the to the uh, municipal uh, education tax. I don't know. Anybody aware of that? Mr. Robinson. Oh, did you want to answer? I, I can attempt. Okay. Uh, for the record, Colin Robinson, Vermont and EA, there, if Julia joins you, uh, you'll see on the bottom of the Ed Fund Outlook that you all chose to reserve a certain amount, I believe about $13 million, don't quote me on that, uh, to the bottom line of the Ed Fund for use in the end fund this year around property tax rates. If that's what you're referring to, Senator Williams, that is there. And I believe the December 1st letter is required to incorporate that into any rate reductions. But, it, but I was also told that, that that rebate that they got from the state can only be used, to, could be applied to education. That money was held on the bottom line of the education fund to be applied in the education fund. Mr. Francis, did you want to add something? I just, um, as you know, Julia Richter is the best person to reply to this. So if you get her, that'll be great. The revenues to the Ed Fund are variable year to year based on the performance of the various tax components that make up of it. 
So, you know, the the property taxes are a big source of monies for the Ed Fund, but there are an array of other taxes that go in as well. And my recollection, and she's going to be able to confirm this, is that through the COVID years, the revenues were very strong in the Ed Fund and some of the expenditures were down because in some instances, schools weren't operating. Um, <clears throat> last year, with the surplus in the Ed Fund, the General Assembly made a decision to use uh, monies for both the PCB program and universal school meals. So, you know, those are policy decisions that the General Assembly makes, but there is an ebb and flow on an annual basis to both the sources and the uses in the Ed Fund. So Julia will be able to give you an expert treatment um, of the explanation to the question but my best response is that each year is different and the General Assembly makes decisions around the uses of the money in particular, depending on <clears throat> what the um, resources available to the Ed Fund are. Thank you. As we're waiting to see if perhaps uh, Ms. Richter is going to join us, I wanted to shift to Mr. Fannett. Unless suit or or uh, Morgan, Mr. Daybell, uh, Ms. Siglowski, did you want to have any final comments? No, thank you. Okay, great. No, thank you. I'm uh, happy to uh, answer any other questions if they come up. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Jeff Fannin, Executive Director of Vermont NEA. Thanks for inviting me here to this discussion. I'm like Jeff Francis said. I um, I think it's great that there's going to be a joint committee hearing. Next week, we would uh, very much like to participate in that and will. Um, I think Jeff did a nice job of contextualizing this. This is a dynamic budgeting season, uh, the greatest one I've seen in my tenure, I think. Um, and there's a lot of changes at play here. And obviously, Jeff identified health care's gone up a lot, uh, salary pressures, um, as those are, and those are national problems, right? Those are not unique and exclusive to Vermont. Those are national uh, challenges that everybody's facing across the country. Um, so we're, we're not immune to the pressures nationally and people are rational actors and uh, school boards, superintendents, uh, business managers, uh, teachers all act rationally and uh, their kids are, they're just their budgets are just simply meeting the needs of the kids, really, and that's what um, they're all doing. Uh, I don't think they're wasting money. They're just uh, I've never thought that. I think that schools do a good job. They're publicly accountable. People get to vote on their school budgets, uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, they get to elect their school board members. That's a good thing. They have adults in the law involved in the lives of children throughout the state, uh, and likewise, that's a good thing. So. I, the dynamics are challenging right now. Uh, back in 2021, I just went back earlier this morning and looked at some of my testimony to the, uh, the waiting task force. Um, we supported the change in the weights. Um, we may have had chat, you know, differences about how the solution came about, but we certainly wanted uh, schools to have an equitable, have ac more equitable access to the education fund dollars. And we knew there would be transitions. And that's why last year the 5% cap was put into place. Um, these were all knowable things. And, and when the December 1st letter came out, uh, there were some pressures on it, but I think it seemed within, within the norms. I think the change, the big change has been the CLA. And I, I don't know if it was uh, Sue or Jeff um, just said it. The, the increase in home values statewide uh, is like nothing I've ever seen. And, and um, that's great because most people, their largest asset is their home. Their home value is going up. That's great. Uh, but it does cause, with the CLA, uh, some, some challenges. And so I think that um, that is something that's worthy of exploration next week, I guess. And you'll get some information, I'm sure, from, uh, from Julia about that and other things. Um, I don't think right now there's any uh, magic solution. I walked into the state house a week or so ago with Jeff Francis and we discussed this and neither one of us had uh, a silver bullet. If there was one, I think we would all have used it by now or at least 
uh, waved it around. Uh, it's going to take some rolling up the sleeves and some creative minds. And I think that sounds like that's what's going to happen next week. Um, so I, I, it is challenging. And uh, we know that what schools are doing are meeting the needs of their students. And that's, that's a good thing. It's very helpful. Yeah, it, it, I, I don't. I don't have a solution for you, Senator. Yeah. Um, I wish I did. Yeah. Well, I think your point's a good one. Next week, we'll gather and have a deeper conversation with all of us, other committees, other experts, um, and see what we uh, can come up with. It, if anything, uh, or as Senator you have said, this this might be the situation that we're in and we might not be able to change direction at this point. And uh, we'll see what happens on meeting day and then what legislature might do after that. It's, it's fast approaching as town meeting day, that is. All right, we, uh, we don't have Ms. Richter available. Uh, she can come in when she has time to step in and let her for 10 minutes. So we'll have Ms. Richter in later today, uh, but we uh, aren't going to be able to get her now. Anybody have any final comments or questions from uh, this group of witnesses? I guess the only thing I'm wondering is, Ms. Siglowski, uh, probably have your ear to the ground better than anyone right now around what school district, what school boards are thinking might happen in March. Uh, any, anything you can say to that, about that? Well, I can say they're working very hard to prepare for um, that vote and to communicate with their communities um, in various ways to make sure that um, the most information can get out there, and um, I, you know, I think they're um, preparing budgets that they feel are responsible and um, meet the needs of their students, and um, and working to pass them. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Anything else? Okay, we will, Mr. Bannon. Anything else? No, just going to say thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, committee. We'll return at three thirty for school safety. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Senate Education on Thursday, January 18th. Uh, we have, we're shipping gears to School Safety Act 29. We have Ms. Barbic with us, the Director of Violence Prevention Task Force, and I'll say, and her team. Uh, Ms. Barbic was instrumental in our work last year. Huge help to us as we move forward. And what we thought we'd hear today is a bit of an update, how Act 29 is rolled out things you're seeing, any concerns, any particular successes, and anything that you think we need to address legislatively going forward. And uh, just as a review, we'll just go around the committee. I know there are a few new people here, so everyone has an opportunity to know who's around the table. We'll start with uh, our new attorney. Hi, uh, Nana Rishim, uh, Senator from Wyndham County. So, yeah. Sure, Martina Rocky, look, Senator from Burlington and Chittenden Central District. Brian Campion, Bennington County District. Dave Weeks, Rowan County. Terry Williams, Rowan County. And we'll just pick it up with, uh, this is, uh, you want to introduce yourself, Finn? Finn, or Comedia, please. I'm Sunny Erickson with uh, Public Safety and the Vermont Food Safety Center. Great. Yeah, okay, I'm Mike McGrath, I work for the VPA. Colin Robinson, Vermont, NEA. Uh, Dan Bates, Deputy Commissioner, Public Safety. Lindsay Hedges, Vermont Agency of Education, and my colleague, Jill Rick Campbell, will be joining us shortly. She's just running Halo Lake. Terrific. Rebecca McBrown with Vermont MEA. Brendan Everwine, legislative intern. Liz Mills with Sats and Redford Consulting. Sats and Redford. Uh, Sats and Redford Consulting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Um, my name is Keith Barbic, and I'm the director of, violence prevent of the Violence Prevention Task Force. Um, within the broad scope of violence prevention, school safety has been a large part of the focus for my position. Um, as you recall, um, there were several major sections to Act 29, which was passed last session. And um, those sections covered uh, a number of different areas to include 
options-based um, response drills and fire drills, access control and visitor management policies, the development and maintenance of emergency operations plans, and training and policy development for school threat assessment teams. Um, the work related to the many parts of this act, including drills, developing EOP, emergency operations plans, which I will refer to as EOPs, and threat assessment training, um, started years ago prior to Act 29 coming into effect. Um, that work was done through a grant, um, and that grant was uh, awarded to the Department of Public Safety specifically to do work on assisting schools in developing their emergency operations plans, providing um, an emergency operations plan template that was available for schools on the Vermont School Safety Center website. Um, workshops were held designed to assist schools in developing their emergency operations plans. And it also included behavioral threat assessment training. Uh, again, this was all prior to um, Act 29 coming into effect. Um, since the passage of Act 29, the Vermont School Safety Center and the Agency of Education have done an incredible amount of work together on the implementation of uh, the Act. This you know, included continual collaboration with schools and stakeholders during this process. Um, much progress has been made in the development of policies, reporting, updating the EOP template to include a guidance document and continue training for behavioral threat assessment teams. Um, there's still a lot of work ahead. Uh, Sunny Erickson of the Vermont School Safety Center and Jill Briggs Campbell of the Agency of Education as well as uh, Carol Jill will be here um, to go into more of the details of the specifics in terms of the work that's been done uh, thus far and work ahead on Act 29. Um, I was going to turn it over to Jill. To, um, she had a PowerPoint and uh, was going to go into some of the nuances and details of um, what AOE has been doing in terms of um, Act 29 implementation. Yes, there you go. I have a question that's not specifically on this topic. It is around safety, though. Um, I was happened to be listening to um, National Public Radio the other day, and they were talking about the successes of anonymous tip lines mm -hmm. in stopping potential violence and tools. And um, I was wondering if that's pain. Mm -hmm. We do. Uh, we do have one. It's uh, Safe for BT, and that is uh, an anonymous tip line, and the uh, calls are answered twenty four seven. Um, there's a process of um, identifying, you know, where that call need, needs to go. Um, if it's an immediate emergency, it would, you know, go to law enforcement. If it needs, like, um, you know, it's a, a high immediacy type of event, or if it's someone who's reporting concern, um, and there are a number of avenues that can go, but they're vetted in the thing to the appropriate location or entity that would appropriately deal with that. Awesome. Do we have any data around? Like how many calls? Yeah, how and successful? I don't have it on hand with me, but it, I can get that data for you. Thank you. Any other questions that I can answer? Um, again, the the um, details and nuances of the work that's been done has um, been done through AOE and um, the Vermont School Safety Center is the as is, is outlined in the act. Um, so I would leave those very specifics to, to AOE and mm -hmm. Vermont School Safety Center, but i um, happy to answer any sort of higher level questions if you have any. Yeah. Um, I have heard anecdotally, I have no numbers to back this up, but I have heard that it's been difficult to put together the behavioral threat teams. I don't know if you've heard anything or if you can speak to that at all, but... Um, I can't speak to, to how difficult it's been. The, the training has been offered um, and, and continues to be offered through 2024 and is, is scheduled out for that. Um, we, there is, uh, is, was a very in-depth, um, thoughtful process on developing policy. And that policy hasn't come out yet, um, but it involved a lot of work with stakeholders, a very large group of stakeholders, so we could get input from a number of different entities and perspectives. Um, it went out for public comment um, in December, 
and it's currently with um, the Agency of Education Legal to revise that policy. Um, so I think that policy will go along the way in clarification um, for that. And again, Louis is not to and the Vermont School Safety Center together very collaboratively in this effort to um, guide schools and provide as much support for schools in this implementation process. Hi. Mm. Apologies, my meeting invites at four. <laughs> so oh. I was upstairs. <laughs> oh, something we like to do. Because I'm always, always early. So, yeah, that's all right. We, we planned for an easy yeah. segue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dave. Apologies. Yeah. Uh, Jill Briggs Campbell, AOE Director of Operations. Yeah. Um, we have sent over a pretty extensive slide deck, which I do not plan to go through slide by slide. Um, the intention there is to sort of remind us of what is in Act 29. It's um, somewhat complicated. I have it open on my desktop pretty much every day and always have to remind myself of each of the sections. Um, but what I was thinking we could do, and, and please let me know if this works for you, um, is sort of go through each of the sections and provide a little update on what we've done what's upcoming for 2024, and then hopefully leave time available for you to ask questions if you have any. Does that work for you? Works for me. Okay, fantastic. Um, so as I'm sure Dee already signaled. And would you mind bringing that up on the screen so those watching could? Yes, I, yeah, I think we up. sent it, or do you want me to try to share? I'm not in the Zoom meeting. Um, if I can share it, but you'll just have to tell me when. Sure, to absolutely. Start. And I'll try to go through it. As I said, I'm not going to go through slide by yeah. slide. I'll go through yeah. somewhat organically. So I'll try to shout out when I'm hitting a particular slide. Um, one thing I wanted to signal is uh, just a sort of brief reminder for us on the second slide, uh, consideration of the hierarchies, uh, because there's a lot of different language included in Act 29. So obviously, we have state law is sort of preeminent. Under that are policies. Policies are passed by school boards, either public school boards or independent school boards. Um, generally speaking, AOE does not develop model policies unless directed to, as we are in Act 29. Sitting under policies are procedures. Uh, those can be adopted by school boards or school uh, SUSDs uh, or independent schools themselves. These tend to have an additional level of detail, right? So there's the you shall do this at a high level, and the, the procedures basically lay out how you do it. And then under that are guidelines and best practices. And uh, AOE, Vermont School Safety Center, uh, other state agencies tend to put out these guidelines and sort of frameworks for how, how should you do it. Um, and within Act 29, all of those exist. So I just wanted to call those out. But, all right, so what's in Act 29? One thing I did want to highlight, um, because it's it's a bit unusual for us, is that Act 29 applies to all Vermont schools, both public and approved and recognized independent schools. I'll be coming back around kind of throughout the presentation to some of the challenges I think that our independent schools are going to have in implementing Act 29 um, with kind of same level of, of rigor and fidelity, and it's not for necessarily lack of trying, it's for a lack of experience with doing some of these pieces of work. So the first uh, sort of top three sections um, include uh, options-based response to violent intruder and fire drills, uh, all hazards emergency operation planning, access control and visitor management policies, and we've got quite a lot of work done in that area already. Then the last section of Act 29 is centered on behavior threat assessment teams. I know you all took significant testimony on that, and we've done quite a bit of work there, but I would say um, a lot more to come, and I'll, I'll be sharing some of those updates with you. And then the last section, which is not included in this presentation because it's not my work uh, <laughs> workload, uh, is uh, Act 29 creates a working group on student protections from harassment and discrimination, and so that's a separate group that's doing that work. I think you've already, um, in previous testimony, heard from our uh, partners at VSBA that some of the initial timelines for Act 29 were pretty aggressive. 
and were really challenging when schools were actually not in session. So some of those initial timelines were, were July of 2023. Um, and I will also call out that we had a historic flooding event starting in July 10th. And um, as it so happens, uh, a lot of the state personnel that are involved in the implementation of Act 29 also happen to meet the uh, emergency uh, response folks. So for example, Sunny Erickson is also part of Vermont Emergency Management. My operations team, and, and I'm the director of emergency response with the AOE and my operations team is as well. So we have to acknowledge that created a delay, but I would say we've got our feet under us now and, and we're actually really digging into this work and I think that we're on track. So um, just a few kind of high level considerations. I'm going to, bear with me, we're gonna skip down <laughs> uh, to slide number five. Um, and one of the initial pieces of work that we needed to do was uh, identify a process whereby schools could indicate that they were meeting the requirements of Act 29. And we did that this year through an assurance process. Are we matched up? Yeah, yeah great. Um, we did that through an assurance process, and that's been um, an iterative process, and we're actually now in the phase of checking checking the math, right, and ensuring that all of our SUs, SDs have completed their assurances, our independent schools have completed their assurances, and now we're in the follow-up uh, round of work. Um, so it was intended to allow respondents to certify their compliance with several key elements of Act 29, specifically those initial ones. Um, it did also acknowledge that some of those initial dates for implementation were going to be challenging, if not impossible, when school was not in session. And so it allowed independent schools or SUSDs to indicate sort of a future anticipated compliance, and it asked them to identify that date. And the date was not, you know, 2027, right? The date was January of this year. So now what we're doing is we're going through we're identifying who indicated future compliance and we are reminding them of their obligation to complete that work and to update their assurances. Uh, it also included um, uh, a requirement that if they've already developed a, model, uh, a policy or they've adopted a policy, they upload that policy, so we've got some data there. And it also asked um, the respondents to indicate if they have a current behavior threat assessment team. That was not information that we had a really good handle on, and as I'll indicate as we move through, there's some work that they're going to be asked to do in relation to that. Moving on to section one, this was the section that uh, required each school board that operates a school and uh, each uh, approved and recognized independent school shall adopt a policy mandating options-based response to violent intruder drills and uh, fire drills. Um, the fire drills are something that we develop in partnership with uh, other state agencies, and it's an annual thing, so there isn't a lot of update there. But for the options-based response to violent intruder drills, there are some updates. Uh, those uh, drills must be age-appropriate, trauma-informed, and options-based. Uh, the Vermont School Safety Center offers a lot of guidance and uh, best practices around this work. So when schools reach out and say, how do we do this? we can direct them towards those resources and our partners at the School Safety Center. Um, it also required a notification to parents not later than one school day before a second drill. So, uh, and finally, I'm sorry, it also requires that schools, as they complete this work, um, report that they've done it to the Agency of Education. We've created a drill reporting tool um, and we will be doing sort of follow-up on that biannually. So they should report by January and by June, and then we to checking uh, insurance compliance there. Uh, so I'm going to skip to slide eight and just sort of indicate what is the work that we've completed to date. We did partner with the FBA to develop a model policy. I think that Sue Sadlowski, again, this happened right as the July flooding took place. So there was a mismatch in time between when the school boards first drafted their sort of initial policy and did a lot of work to try to get that passed versus when we released our drill guidance, which was in September. And that was purely a result of the flooding, just a lack of capacity at the state. When we it, we um, 
identified that there was a mismatch between those, we immediately partnered up with the SBA and uh, they were able to adjust that policy and now the two things match really well. So I think that was an example of maybe a little bit of a bumpy start, but actually the strong partnership that we've developed with them, which we continue to have ongoing. Um, we also, again, released our annual guidance uh, in compliance with Act 29. We also um, presented a webinar and provided resources for independent schools around all of the different elements of Act 29. This is a place where they need additional support. Um, many of our schools are starting, I would say, at, at minus square one. <laughs> Uh, they might not have an emergency operations plan at all. They might not have an access control policy at all. And um, I'll talk about some of the specific challenges that they're facing in terms of access controls. Um, so we we um, recognize that was an issue. We've been uh, holding additional webinars and, and sort of support opportunities for them. And they are actually reaching out to us and to our partners at school safety centers who are asking for some advice and how do we do this and having um, Rob Evans available as a consultant to sort of talk them through like this is how you might create um, access controls in a space that's a shared space or a leased space. Those are some of the specific issues that are in schools um, have faced. We've also offered a similar webinar to public schools. Um, they have as of this moment declined because they've got their hands full, but we'll be still looking back to them, of course, and we're always in close contact with um, our partners at VSA, BPA, and VSBA. Um, so in terms of work plans, so on slide nine, based on feedback from school partners, uh, there may be a need to create a small schools working group led by the school safety center to develop uh, procedures to support student safety, um, develop uh, emergency operations plans. Many of our uh, independent schools are very, very small. You know, their staff might consist of two people, three people. Um, many of them lease their spaces. Many of them operate within shared spaces, uh, things like a church or a community center. Um, and many of them highly prioritized, I think as many of our Vermont schools do, sort of a combination of indoor-outdoor learning, learning taking place within the community. So how do we balance that really, it's a strength of our Vermont education system with some of the requirements of Act 29. And so that's, I think, where um, our small schools, whether they're public or independent, could use a bit of additional support. And so we might actually be creating sort of a community of practice around that. Um, as I said, we're in kind of the uh, oversight and compliance mode when it comes to the assurance. So who's reported, hasn't, uh, we'll be using that data and turning it into a public dashboard at the end as one of our compliance and oversight measures that we have. Um, I would say that an additional challenge for some of our recognized independent schools is they're not used to this necessarily this level of engagement with state agencies. Um, and so we're going to have to do some additional touch points and outreach with them. All right, moving on, uh, section two, emergency operations planning. So the requirements are that each SUSD uh, and or independent school, both approved and recognized, shall adopt and maintain an all hazards emergency operations plan. It must be reviewed and updated on an annual basis. And key component here is that it um, needs to be as comprehensive as the All Hazards Emergency Operations Plan template, and it must be developed and updated in collaboration with local emergency first responders and local emergency management officials. This is critical. One um, thing that we certainly have identified in the experience of the July flooding, and then again in December 18th, in the, the rain event and flooding that happened there, is, um, our experience in working with probably the top 10 most impacted districts is that where they had longstanding firm relationships with their local first responders, when we would reach out to them and say, do you know where your kids are? Do you know what families are in need? They knew. They Even though school wasn't in session, they knew because they were in touch with their local first responders. They had longstanding relationships with them and it was in their emergency operations plan. So as the fire department was going door to door, they were identifying, oh, we have three minors in this household. We need to let the school district know. And they were able to almost immediately start to provide supports. 
other districts, not for a lack of trying or effort, do not have those same kind of levels of relationships in place. And so there's a there's an artificial disconnect that exists there. And so part of this reason for this engagement is because we've seen the way it actually plays out in real life and the way that it can impact the ability of schools and communities to, to support students. And I'll also say at the state level, it impacts our ability to get good data, right? And to know when we are working with task forces and we are working with FEMA and American Red Cross to be able to say, we know we've got 23 kids in Johnson that have been impacted and we need to ensure that they're getting fed, closed, sheltered, right? And that brings a level of detail to our ability to respond. So all around, it's going to have a key impact. Where we're at with this is that we are in the process of completing a major revision to the current emergency operations plan. We've split it into a template, uh, which is something that most, I want to signal this, we're not starting from square one with our public schools. They pretty much all of our SUs and SDs already have an emergency operations plan. So for them, this is going to be a process of revision, improvement, ensuring that they're maintaining, that they're doing training exercises, et cetera, et cetera. For a lot of our independent schools, this is starting from square one. Um, and so we provided a template that they can use that will result in an emergency operations plan and with it a guide. How do you do this work? And as part of this, they will also be, we've already got these scheduled, uh, the Moscow Safety Center has these scheduled through spring of 2024. The readiness and emergency management for schools, REMS training. These things go hand in hand, right? You take the REMS training, it tells you how to do emergency operations planning, you identify your team, you work on the plan, you make revisions and updates, and you have your local first responders and emergency management officials involved in the process all the way. So work plan for 2024, these REMS trainings, and I'm on slide 13 here. Oh. If you're Following along at home, uh, REMS trainings for schools and local disaster management and first responders are scheduled. They're starting to run. Uh, there'll be ongoing technical assistance from the Vermont School Safety Center uh, with specific supports for small schools who may need to identify how they're going to have these robust plans. Um, on the AOE operation team side of things, we will be aligning the requirements of DOP plan and templates with our district quality standards. So, Senator Kulik has a question. Yeah, I hate to interrupt you. No, please go. You were doing up. such a nice job. Um, has there been talk about uh, the fact that maybe like small schools need a different option? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are actually doing that review uh, live right now. <laughs> well, I think we have a meeting scheduled, I think, on Monday. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be going through that template and identifying. First, we need to sort of define what is a small school, right? And maybe there's there's different levels and then go through kind of this universal template and try to identify what are the places where, you know, maybe a, a, a micro school, like a very tiny school might not need to have X, Y, or Z, or this is how they could do X, Y, or Z. So right. yeah. and is that something we need to tackle the statute or? No, I don't believe so. I kind of get, we can tackle it. Senator Williams. The uh, issue, municipality, is, I think is required now to have a local emergency management board. This could almost be an annex of that. Yeah, and Sonny, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because this is some of the work that you do in PEI. Sure, I would just say that we at Vermont Emergency Management, when we're working with all of the local emergency managers, the directors there, we always encourage the sharing of plans within their local community. So in case there's a response need, they're familiar with what processes within their individual schools and their communities. Absolutely. So there should be a really fruitful cross-pollination mm -hmm. happening between these plans. And that's, I think, the BEM is really messaging that to their municipalities that they're working with as well. Um, so I think we have a moment of opportunity here. And, and I think the July flooding was, um, I was going to say a watershed moment, but that's the terrible pun. And I, it's just the word that came to mind. So, okay. Um, one thing I do want to indicate uh, is, and I'll, I'll sort of, this lies further down in the slide deck, but this is the moment to, to discuss it. Um, because this work around emergency operations planning does need to be thoughtful, planful, folks are busy, it really does need to engage with local first responders and man emergency management folks. Um, it's the recommendation of the School Safety Center, DPS, and AOE 
that this deadline actually be extended. This is something that we really feel should be done with rigor um, and fidelity. And we also know that for, um, at minimum, our SDs and SDs, they have emergency operations, but it's, it's not like they're out there with nothing. So there's not this great risk. And I would also, I'm going to hazard a guess here that all of our larger independent schools also have some level of emergency operations plan as well. So we do have a recommendation, um, we can give you statutory language for this, that that deadline be extended up to July of 2025, but we are going to be releasing this template, the REMS trainings, and we'll be really working with schools to ensure that they're not procrastinating on this one. All right. Um, access control and visitor management, I think we can do this pretty briefly because it's along the same lines as the drill reporting. Um, and just so you know, we are approaching time. We can go okay. over a little bit. Okay, but, Yeah. absolutely. So we'll kind of cruise through this section uh, really briefly. They needed to develop policy. Most of them have done it. It's in the assurances. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some caveat language that was included in there around um, if a school recognizes the need to leave a specific structure unlocked, and it called out kind of what the legislative intent was there, I'll signal that some of our independent schools are actually using that caveat language in their policy. It doesn't make sense for them to pass a policy for which they're automatically out of compliance. But what I want to signal here is that those access controls, things like key locks, um, door cameras, those sorts of things are expensive and there is no identified funding source for that. So it's just something for all of us to consider how do we resource school safety and specifically that infrastructure need um, because our, our independent schools and our public schools are sort of signaling like this is not something that we necessarily can pay for. So that, all right, um, let's move to the behavior spread assessment. I think D, as I was walking in, was uh, uh, indicating and, and sharing that um, the sort of initial work that needs that needed to be done in Act 29 was the development of a model policy. Um, we have, and I'm on slide 19, um, we did engage in a, a pretty lengthy and uh, in, um, in-depth stakeholder engagement uh, that included a lot of the advocacy groups that you heard from last session. Um, that model policy was released on December 1. There was public comment. And at this moment, AOE Legal Counsel is really reviewing that public comment. I acknowledge that it's late, um, but I would also say that this model policy is basically foundational to all of the work that will follow from it. And that some of the um, public comment and stakeholder feedback that was given needs really careful consideration. And so we're taking that additional time to ensure that this is done very well. Um, as a sort of order of operations, once that model policy is released, the next round of work is going to be looking at all of the VTA guidance that has already been published and ensure that it actually lines up with the model policy and then identify what are the tools that our schools need to be able to implement VTA teams. The final thing I'll share is that um, there is also sort of an immediate requirement around current BTA teams. So there's all of these different requirements within Act 29 and it sort of calls out, if you've got a current BTA team, you need to be in compliance with this by the start essentially of the next school year. Our intention is to um, support current teams in that process. Uh, one of the ways that we're intending to do this is you all have a Budget Adjustment Act uh, request for $50,000 because there was no Funding identified for that work. You, you gave it to the house, correct? We did give it to the yeah, house. Okay. Yeah, we'll be getting You're that presentation. Um, and we've we've identified how we plan to use that money. Uh, we're going to be holding a one-day conference slash workshop in late spring. It will include um, sort of an introduction to the model policy, new procedures and tools, and critically. Um, some diversity, equity, and inclusion training. We've been working really closely with the Office of Racial Equity. They've been great partners in evaluating our current training, offering suggestions. Um, and then moving forward into the future, what I would say about BTA and something that I think we have a strong consensus across all the agencies is that BTA is a program and it should be treated as such. Uh, we can check the box and implement and say, oh, we've got We've got teams, they've all been identified, they're all gonna do their reporting, but really if we want to do this in a way that has the rigor and fidelity of what's intended in Act 29, and I think what our advocacy groups want, 
um, to ensure that we are not disproportionately impacting marginalized students, um, that we are doing this in a way that's effective, that it is not a law enforcement activity, but is one of a part of multi-tiered system of support, um, that we should treat it as a program. And so again, I'm sort of identifying future needs for resources that if we're going to do this well, we need to resource it. If as part of MTSS, is it tier three? Where would you place it on the? I would want to. I I think that what we haven't yet done is had an opportunity to actually engage with our AOE MTSS team. We've we've been talking to them, but we haven't dug in yet. And so identifying where it is, I'm thinking it really depends on the student and what the sort of behaviors are, right? So is this a student who is just having some challenging behaviors? Is this a student um, that is potentially a real risk of, of sort of imminent danger to themselves or others? And so then what are the appropriate levels of support and additional back to them? That's but great. We want to work with our MTSS team to yeah. think about how to integrate it. And I know we're running out of time, but um, this is, and this may be a bizarre question, but how is like, truancy playing into this? That's really interesting. I happen to be sitting in a conversation about that right now. Um, so I don't know that it, I don't know that we have a, a handle necessarily on how those things are interacting. And I think it's why we need to integrate it into these larger conversations. So there is a conversation that's happening right now around chronic absenteeism, redefining truancy. Um, I would certainly invite you to um, have Ann for now come in to discuss that work. I'm not the expert, I'm a fly on the wall in those conversations. But again, how do we treat this as an integrated thing and how might chronic absenteeism be an indicator of other issues that we need to mm -hmm. engage with? Thank you. Yeah. Sir Arshim, I know you have a four o'clock meeting you mentioned. Do you have any questions before, for uh, our witness? So I do not, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you for letting me breathe Here's through that as quickly as possible. Any other questions? Well, it's just so curious on your um, your, your emergency operations. <laughs> are, are you discovering it? You said that a lot of schools already have emergency operations plans, which is a good thing. Yeah. Right, but in your uh, rollout, are you seeing that schools, like other areas, that schools like uh, seem to have have to now incorporate? Like, is there a is there a common thread on what you're requesting them to add into their EOPs? Sunny, so, do you do you have anything in particular? I've got one or two examples that pop out for me. I think the thing that popped into my uh, head are the we've added some new annexes uh, mm -hmm. for consideration. I think especially including you know what to do in flooding situations, which mm -hmm. might not have previously been included in some mm -hmm. um, EOPs. But I, I would say adding support mechanisms around you know specific threats is, is what comes to yeah. mind. That I was I was going to say the same thing. There's been recent incidents that have indicated that folks might need to beef up their. Um, response to potentially hazardous or dangerous materials or items on campuses. Um, we're also encouraging as like uh, VDH has some health initiatives that are rolling out like stop with lead or the provision of um, naloxone, Narcan, that should be in integrated into their EOP planning. How do you respond to a suspected overdose on campus? Unfortunately, is something that everyone should be prepared for, even if we're not seeing that happen on school campuses. Thank you. Um, then we want them to be prepared for it, and it should be integrated into their field. Right? Okay, good. And then just final question, very quick. Um, in your EOP plans, are you envisioning the schools as being kind of like a community center for prepared, not preparedness, but reaction to? <clears throat> natural disaster incidents of various times. Yeah, so this is something that's actually very close to my heart because I also do school construction and facilities, as Senator Kulik knows. And um, I think that we really need to start to understand that our school buildings serve as critical mm -hmm. community resources during all kinds of emergencies, flooding, power outages, blizzard, all sorts, and we need to ensure that those buildings are resilient and that they can function as such. Um, so for those who are already identified as emergency shelters, certainly that should be in their EOP plans, and I would, I would be looking out for that as we're supporting them, but I think that we should consider that more broadly um, because I think they're critical community infrastructure and should be treated as such if I'm gonna get on my soapbox. <laughs> 
Ms. Barbara, when we were looking at this bill last year, was there discussion around the state colleges and UVM as it relates to school safety? Uh, not specifically. Okay. Um, or the, even the independent colleges? I uh, I will say this, um, the University of Vermont was just awarded a, uh, a federal grant to look at this very topic. Okay. So what they are doing is embarking on offering um, threat assessment training to all of the colleges and universities in Vermont and also um, large and uh, mid, large and middle level uh, employers, mid-sized employers. Um, the the great thing about it is uh, they put out the RFP for um, who would provide that training, mm -hmm. and it is the same. Uh, the, the RFP was awarded to the same group that's doing the threat assessment training that we have been doing for the last several years and are continuing to do um, in our our uh, K through twelve schools. So there's going to be this great continuity <laughs> from what's happening in our K two through twelve schools to what's happening in our IHEs. So, um, but there is work um, being done um, in that realm and UVM, uh, if you go to their website, there's a link, I couldn't direct you exactly how to get to it, but you can find it and it goes into what their plan is for that training um, for the next year anyway. That's super. That is, yeah. Any comments from you, Ms. Barbara, or anyone else on your team? Um, I, you know, to, to Jill's point, the um, a lot of uh, incredible amounts of, of work have gone into um, Act 29, um, and some of the dates are aggressive, um, and we're finding that as we're embarking on this um, on this road. So just uh, that we're mindful of that. Um, you may come back if you <clears throat> at some point, Jules. I suspect uh, to propose additional time? Certainly at this point, it's the EOP plan specifically that okay. we've identified that that date is, I think, probably too aggressive for folks to do it in the way that we want them to do it. Um, we are applying for some federal slash state money to support a consultant for the BTA implementation. Um, I think that's a critical resource that we need. It's not expertise that we necessarily have in house at this point. Um, and so uh, I'll just identify that that's a resource need that we're trying to fill. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, if we get that, that might be from us. Yeah. And the sooner you can get language to, uh, to the committee, to Morgan, the better we give a miscellaneous education sure. bill that we'll start to put together. Yeah. And that would be, be great to get that in there. We can definitely commit to getting that to her. Anything else? Apologize again for the scheduling. Nope, Thank you for well, no, right. <laughs> Thanks for all that you're doing. <laughs> great seeing all of you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will go back to my construction task force report. Ms. Myers, when you're the Here's in about 15, 20 minutes. With, uh, at 4.30, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Julie Richard. Oh, sure. to respond to her question. She's going to call you. Uh, I'd like to hear something. I'd like to hear something. I'll stay here so we have a forum. No, we are. Uh, Jules is just trying to get in. Okay. We're just waiting for our witness. Yeah. But you know what I'm yeah. I, I was going to go. But if the chairman wants to be well, well, I mean, literally, it's 430 versus 435. I mean, you know. I'm here. Uh, Ms. Myers, we're yeah. under a time crunch. Okay. Uh, we'll be quick. We'll talk quick. Great. Thank you both. Uh, you're <laughs> testifying together. Yeah. Ms. Myers and Mr. McGrath. Ms. Myers is from the Vermont Super uh, Tennis Association. Mr. McGrath. Mr. McGrath? Yeah. yeah cool. Am I right? Well, yeah. I don't want to be wrong. McGrath. McGrath. Yeah. Mr. McGrath, thank you is the Assistant Executive Director of the Vermont Principal Association. And we are talking about S87. Uh, and we asked our usual suspects, if you will, in the public education realm, uh, to uh, weigh in on the bill. Who is yours? Uh, 
Great, thank you. Um, I've got some prepared testimony and we'll send it to you if we haven't already. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting us to provide testimony on behalf of the Superintendent Association and the Principal Association on the proposed S87. All cost education promotes awareness, empathy, collective responsibility to prevent such atrocities in the future, fostering society's commitment to justice, human rights, and the preservation of peace. As S87 states, according to the Anti-Defamation League, over the past decade, there has been a marked surge in anti-Semitic and racist violence in the United States and Europe. By learning about the systemic state-sanctioned genocide, six million Jews and other marginalized groups, students gain a profound understanding of the consequences of unchecked prejudice and hatred. We fully support the continued teaching of Holocaust education in Vermont schools. We unequivocally believe that all Vermont schools should be teaching students about the Holocaust. Indeed, it is part of the curriculum in our public schools. To the best of our knowledge, if passed, S87 would be the first piece of legislation to mandate curriculum in Vermont. This would be a significant shift from how Vermont has previously legislated around what educators teach in schools. Currently, to quote the Agency of Education's recent testimony about the regulatory framework surrounding curriculum, Vermont's regulatory structure directs local boards to set graduation requirements and develop and select curriculum methods of instruction, locally developed assessments, and the content and skills to be learned within a supervisory union. Supervisory union boards are responsible for ensuring alignment to state adopted standards, and those standards need to be inclusive of the minimum course of study delineated in the relevant statutes. BSA and VPA took note of the Agency of Education's call to align proposed legislation within the implementation of the proposed education quality standards and subsequent ethnic and social equity content standards. That work currently sits with the State Board of Education for their consideration for adoption. When adopted, these rules and standards will require each school district to provide learning opportunities that allows students to demonstrate proficiency in ethnic and social equity studies, including the definition of ethnic groups as defined in Act 1 of 2019, which states, in part, groups that have been historically subject to persecution or genocide. As of December 7, 2023, the proposed revisions to the educational quality standards define ethnic groups exactly as it was stated in Act 1 of 2019. The State Board of Education signaled its duty to consider the adoption of ethnic and social equity content standards and appointed the subcommittee to begin this work September 20, 2023, according to their uh, meeting minutes. Act 175 of 2022 stated that on or before January 15th, 2023, there's 24. 24. 24. 24. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 24. 24. The Agency of Education shall issue a written report to the State and House Committees on Education on the status of the Holocaust education in public schools and its recommendations to ensure that Holocaust education is included in the educational programs provided to the students in public schools. That report has not yet been able to be provided. We have noted the important partnership with the Vermont Holocaust Museum to develop ongoing professional learning and resources to schools around the state. And based on some recent conversations anecdotally with educators, Holocaust education is currently embedded intentionally into deeper unit studies in line with the C3 content standards and connected to transfer of skills. The importance of the Holocaust education cannot be overstated. This is a vital piece of learning that continues to occur in our schools throughout the state. And we hope that you'll consider to continue taking testimony from educators leading this work. Can I ask a specific question? So yeah. you're representing the principals and the superintendents. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So the bill had a very specific outline of uh, the scope of study as far as like the number of hours per year, or the, the number of hours and uh, that it's an annual, which should recommend it as an annual uh, training uh, education requirement. Do you agree with that? Level is that something you're willing to? It was six hours per year, 
Is that? I think we would point to the part in our uh, testimony that calls on us to consider what we've historically done around curriculum in the state of Vermont. And if we, if the legislature is going to move in the direction of mandating curriculum, considering that within the context of the education regulatory framework moving forward. Okay. Can you? <laughs> Okay, so do you want to say it quickly? Yeah, yeah like, sure, I'll try to rephrase. Yeah. Currently, the legislature does not dictate yeah. what it, the curriculum, yeah. and so I think we would stand uh, that or answer that question with that, that six hours, 12 hours would still be within the realm of dictating curriculum. But, uh, it, yeah, it's definitely a legislation of curriculum. Yeah. Right? But I'm curious if you've been able to get with your uh, your constituents about you know, the impact on their annual, their other annual training requirements, education requirements, uh, if, you know, if the impact of six hours is. So I did have the opportunity to speak to a few curriculum leaders that I was with yesterday. So I can't speak broadly from the superintendent's perspective on this uh, question, but what I did learn from those curriculum directors um, is that putting some constraints around the hours might actually um, kind of reverse the course of that deeper learning opportunity when it's embedded within like the framework of the standards. So we we would have fear, I'm not saying that it would happen, that the six hours would become more of a check mark each year rather than an intentional um, well, additive to the, the coursework. So like, uh, yeah, putting some contact around it and framework, we wouldn't want it to just become, okay, we're required to do six hours, so we're gonna check that off. Um, when currently we believe that the that Holocaust education is very intentionally built within the framework of their coursework in schools. Okay. I sure. cannot speak to the superintendents at large on that, so I'm just gonna quick, quick, uh, phrase that from the curriculum directors I've spoken with. Okay. Would you pass me your testimony, yes. please? And would you email it, please, yes. to Morgan yeah, as yeah. soon as possible? Yes, because exactly. I think there's some key things in there that we want to follow up. Oh, yes, please. Mike, would you add to that question? Or? Uh, I agree. Yeah. And, you know, your question is around, I, I think you um, said the word training, then corrected, right? It's, it's a background that, problem. Yeah. Right. And I, I think that that may speak to a uh, concern that I would have personally around it, right, is we wouldn't want it to be considered a training. I think our schools are taking, yeah, it, very, right, taking it very seriously and, and doing in-depth work around it. And we, and we want to make sure that that's the case and, and continue to do that. My, my apologies. My apologies. So using the word training was something just given my background. Just, I understand. Uh, so yeah. education, I meant education. Yeah. I think it does is important to think about like the resources that the agency is requiring and our educators, do they feel equipped to teach Holocaust studies? And that I think that status report that was required was would have been a pretty good opportunity to look at like our educators um, equipped with the knowledge to be able to effectively teach about the Holo about Holocaust education. Um, and it's unfortunate we haven't been able to dig into that question a little bit more. Mr. Fannin. That's not mind sticking around with the platform. No, we don't. No, you're there. Go on, sir. Please, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I just had a quick question, Jeff, before you jump in um, and sort of statement slash question. Uh, you mentioned that there are, there's no statute that we don't have. We don't dictate curriculum in the list. So to the best of our knowledge. And so I, I'm going to push back a little bit and commit to more learning because I'm not an expert in this, but it seems like yesterday we didn't do a deep mining of Title 16, but we did pick up fairly quickly that it looks like tobacco and alcohol education is mandated in statute. Um, so that is that is like one area where we do dictate curriculum. And then, like I said, we didn't go deep into Title 16, but Ledge Council um, thought that there might be other instances. So I guess it's not, I don't know if we can make that blanket statement. So that's pure, right? I think. Even I thought yeah. it was right yesterday. Right. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, boards work. Mr. Bennett. Yes. Hello. You have Bennett's testimony. Yes, I submitted to Morgan a little bit earlier. I think you have that. 
We do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. All right. Thank you uh, for inviting me to speak with you about uh, S87, the Holocaust Studies Bill. Uh, we full support the continued teaching of the Holocaust in Vermont schools. Indeed, it is vital that we never forget the horrors of the Holocaust and that our students learn about the atrocities committed against the Jewish people. Uh, as was pointed out yesterday, uh, however, the bill we think the bill would be would best accomplish its stated goals by requiring the proposed Act 1 standards to be revised to include teaching about the Holocaust. The Education Quality Standards, or EQS, uh, being revised by Act 1's racial equity standards is the logical place to include teaching about the Holocaust, and all schools that receive public education fund money should be required to adhere to these new standards, and it's not too late. Uh, while amending... Excuse me? Nothing. Okay. While amending the new act standards makes good sense, what we at Vermont NEA know is that almost every student graduates having received lessons in the Holocaust. Uh, indeed, when I unscientifically, admittedly, <laughs> asked teachers last fall, we have a fall tour, if you will, meetings around the state, whether they were teaching about the Holocaust, most laughed at me and said, of course we are teaching about the Holocaust. And I believe you've heard from teachers in the AOE about how the existing, and, and again, Mike here in Chelsea, that uh, how the existing social studies and language arts standards already include Holocaust standards. And these standards, are, uh, we commonly refer to as C3 and uh, the Common Core standards, as well as the pro, uh, portrait of a graduate. Uh, they do not mandate how or what specific content within the Holocaust to teach, but they specify the skills we want all students to be able to acquire through their lessons and discussions. Um, as the AOE pointed out yesterday, that is the Vermont tradition, establishing state standards that local school boards, curriculum directors, and teachers then implement. Notwithstanding the fact that Vermont's public schools already are teaching about the Holocaust and the state has Holocaust standards, both of which Vermont NEA supports, Vermont NEA opposes S-187 for technical and long-standing reasons that you just discussed, really. Requiring what to teach and how to teach a specific subject runs counter to the state's approach to locally accountable public community-supported schools, which Vermont NEA has always supported. It also misses the fact that Vermont's professional teachers are teaching in the Holocaust now, as prescribed by these above-listed standards, but if a teacher is not teaching about the Holocaust, then that needs to be addressed locally and not through a bill. And finally, if you insist on passing the bill, at a minimum, Section 5, the effective date, should be amended to say that the requirements in the bill are not uh, effective unless and until the agency hires an employee who is responsible for the technical assistance required of the agency. Without that change, schools will be left with the requirement, but no support as envisioned by the bill. Thank you. And happy to answer some questions if you have any. Any questions for Mr. Fenn? Good. Hey, Ms. Richter, here we go. She said she was going to be here in person. Okay. Right. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, we do have a question. Sorry, Jeff. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, what, what, how, what would the technical assistance look like? How, what do you envision with the technical assistance? I, I don't know. I know that um, the bill calls for it, and um, that that might need to be fleshed out a bit. Okay. And I think it's but, also. But certainly, I mean, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, but certainly the the person there would be a person, a human being, yeah. doing that work that that currently is not being asked of the agency. Uh, we want to make sure that that person's in place to give the support to the schools to do the work. And I think you're not, I'll say it, it we have, I have concerns that the agency is understaffed and this would certainly go right to that issue, uh, the heart of that issue, making certain that if we add additional responsibilities to the agency, we have uh, increased staffing. And it, it, frankly, it goes along with a lot of the conversations we've been having around a range of issues. Uh, making certain that schools have to support and making certain that certain things are being done that we're hoping that they, they do, asking them to do. Agreed. Anything else before we shift to um, a quick fiscal update with Ms. Richter? Perfect timing. 
can I just yes, please. conclude with, I think that um, hearing from curriculum, curriculum directors is super important because they can put it within the context of the overall picture better than I think Mike and I can do. Uh, so, you know, I yes, I appreciate that very much. I think right now the committee has, has had enough testimony where I think the committee can maybe over the weekend think about this and decide which direction you want to go. Sounds good. I have one yeah. question about Mike and Chelsea. So, what what region of the state are you from? Like, what, where's your where's your experience? Where are you? It's a good question. I um, well, do now that I've worked in the statewide role, you know, for the last four and a half years, you start to get a better sense of the whole state, which has been really one of the best parts of the job. Um, but I worked and lived in Franklin County. Uh, I was a school counselor and middle school principal in Enosburg, and then I was high school principal in Montpelier, and I live in Chittenden County now. Good, good. My experience is from out of state, though I'm born and raised a multi-generation Vermont family, so I came back to join the Vermont Superintendents Association mm -hmm. from other states. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Thanks. Nice to see you all. First. Good to see you. Ms. Richter, do you mind joining us? We have just a couple of questions, I think, for you. And thank you for jumping in like this. Yes, we happy really to help. We know you had a very busy day because I believe the emergency board met. Yes, that's why I wasn't able to join you earlier. Yes, uh, and so thank you very much. Really grateful. And I think we'll be relatively uh, quick in our question. We're wondering about... One of the things that the committee uh, was wondering is, has a list started to be compiled of districts around what their budgets are going to look like, whether where the increases are, where there might be decreases? Is that kind of information available? Is that really? Kind of yeah, so where are we getting? Our only source is the paper or the, the superintendent's contract. He's talking about all of us, not just you and Senator Terry. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I <laughs> meant to do like this. <laughs> 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 uh, so we're just, just curious if, if it, if, you know, we, we asked um, the, the school board association if they had started compiling a list of, of uh, expected budget uh, impacts, whether positive or negative. So anyways. Then it was thought that maybe GFO had such a collecting such a Sure. So for the record, Julia Richter, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, unfortunately, I can't say yes, we have that list yet. And I can provide some context as to why not and what that will look like. So school budgets are in the process, as you know, of building and developing their budgets. They're warning those budgets over the next couple of weeks. Um, as that data starts to come in, um, that data is being sent to the Agency of Education, and the Agency of Education starts to compile that list, which they in turn will share with us, the JFO. Um, so AOE would be the point of contact to be able to share with the committee what budgets they've seen thus far and what they look like. Um, we do have you know, the preliminary projections that were used in the December 1 modeling. Um, and of course, that that is stale because it was December one projections. With respect to um, changes in, I believe you're talking earlier about Act One Twenty Seven. Yes. Um. So so if the question also came up, well, what about the change in in weights and taxing capacity? Um, AOE is either in the process or has just recently finalized the long term weighted counts by school district. And so once that is finalized, then um, you could look at school districts to see how, how tax capacity has shifted. But that too is not, is not finalized. Uh, so do you know when AOE might get those numbers? With respect to the long-term weighted ADM or the budget? The data? budget. That will be um, ongoing. So they probably- So they have some now. Probably. Okay. Um, as a as a sort of a sense of timing, um, the yield bill usually starts with the house and house ways and means. So usually starting towards the end of January, I'm going in in concert with my counterpart at AOE 
And they're talking Who's about that, my Nicole Lee. So she has Brad stepped James. into Brad James' okay. role. Cool. Mm -hmm. Nicole Lee, she's excellent. Great. Um, and we'll go in and, and she'll talk about, here's what we're seeing in terms of budget data, and then I can help. This is what that looks like in the statewide end. We can ask for both of yeah, we don't need a perfect product. Yeah. No. You know, just a sense of the where things are going. Sure. Where, where any, the any, I think any other questions for Ms. Oh. Richter? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other business questions, comments? I think we. Just, can I, yes. Can yes. I respond to the last few folks about the Holocaust? Or is it too? Um, not okay. You, you, well, how long? Yeah, I, briefly? Just very briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Fishman from a Holocaust Memorial. Um, just, just what the last few folks were saying, and I, sorry, I don't have everybody's names, but that I was at the Act One meeting this morning. For the house, and there's nothing about Holocaust in there. Mm -hmm. They're coming into soon next week to talk to us about some of this. Oh. Yeah. But if, yeah. if we're relying on that, I think we're right. just it's it's not there. Right. And equity is not the same as teaching history. We're talking about current classrooms behavior and then people being comfortable versus the history. Those are very different things. Um, and this you brought up the idea of um, we do teach alcohol and drugs. In the schools, you know, that's specifically mandated. Why can't Holocaust be put in just under the whole social studies space? Very short sentence. We can include it. It's that important. We need to teach about bigotry and all the isms and racism, and it, it, we need it. The students need to learn about hate. They need to learn about preserving democracy. It's as important, if not more important. Just to push back for a second, so the NEA is saying that it, it exists in the social studies and language art standards, include Holocaust studies. Then I want to see it. I, I, I okay. haven't found it. Okay. All right. That's so helpful. They, yeah. They keep yeah. saying it's there, but we just can't find it. Yeah, please go ahead. Do you know the, the, um, what the technical assistance pieces in the bill? No. That made no sense okay. to me. I don't know what they're All talking right. about because technically it's assisting, I and mean, we've got there's so many places to get curriculum right. from. I don't know what they're. I mean, they're that asking, bill, who wrote who? Center lines. Okay. We can ask. Like they're asking for someone to to be able to count how many schools right. are doing it. I don't know if they're asking you for that part of writing the bill. Okay. No. I, I my impression, it, but I think you're point to you're raising a good point. Maybe this isn't technical. Maybe it's another kind of assistance that they're really looking for. Curriculum guidance, that sort of thing. Because that's that's out there. The USHM right, and, right, and right, Echoes and Reflections. Right. There's there's free materials everywhere, easy. Right, but this to your point, yeah. this would my sense is this is what we would call the belly button you would push for that particular topic. You know, that that's instead of having you know a wide variety of uh, options, that this is a okay, Vermont State. Agency of Education, this is the point person who coordinates. Right, I, I get that. I just was hoping to have a little bit like of a background of where that came from and what more specifically they were thinking they wanted. And would that be like a one FTE position or? That's what it's Okay, all right. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, sorry. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, I think there is, we, we should try to figure out that this NEA testimony. Yeah, it, it yeah. didn't quite make sense to me. What I'll ask Mr. Fannin to do, and I'll uh, is to point us and you to that standard, and we'll see if you're Let's, right. but yeah, yeah, because yeah. you haven't found it, and okay. and he's also saying we're teaching it, right? And so if we want to codify it, big deal. They don't have to change their behavior. If they're already doing it, but we it's safe for the future when people if people decide not to teach it. So. If they're already teaching it, it shouldn't be bad for just right now say, and you will teach it. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for very sticking much. around. Thank you. We've had a busy afternoon. Yeah, it's been a long day. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.